Ahoy, we are live. Uh, I'm going to post some tweets and uh, get social ready and uh, hopefully talk to you guys soon. One sec. Oh, let me get chat up. Okay. Bothers me that it still says make a monster, I should say. Create a campaign. Fooey. One moment, friends. <laughs> Just getting the chat up, that way I can talk to y'all. How is everybody doing tonight? This, uh, this fine Sunday night. Pop out the chat. Okay, great. And we're ready to get started. Oh, oh no, recursive. Okay, cool. Let me check this and make sure it's working. Hmm. Does not seem to be. Well, that's fine. Hey, Brent. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, uh, so we took a couple weeks off from streaming, um, partially for Mother's Day and partially for Game of Thrones, because people were just busy on Sunday nights, understandably. But now that we are back, uh, we are going to shift focus and start working on something new. We had been working on our villains for a very long time, for a couple of months, um, and that needs a bunch of editing and a bunch of processing on my end before we can really do anything with those. So we're going to wait and hold off on that. But in the meantime... We're going to do a couple weeks. Uh, probably we'll do a couple weeks of this and then a couple weeks of villain design and alternate back and forth. That's something I've been waiting to do for a long time. Uh, I am already thinking about my next campaign. And so we're going to do a little bit of, hey, Jose, a little bit of world building design. So I have drawn down some ideas. Um, I've alluded to this a little bit as to what the campaign is about on Twitter. But we're going to do kind of a general overview. Okay, so a little bit more than a few ideas. Um, but it needs a lot of work. It's uh, nowhere near ready to go. So we'll talk general overview, and then um, we'll dive down. But I might wait a couple minutes until some more people show up. How are y'all doing? What's up, Jack? Hey, Brent. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, we'll see who all shows up. we got a good group going already. How's your weekend, everybody? Let's see. <sighs> My weekend is okay. It's um, I have tomorrow off. I'm hoping to get a bunch of stuff done tomorrow that I'm behind on, with like all 400 of the various projects that I've been working on. Um, but it's Sunday. Normally we would have dungeon crawl, but we did not have dungeon crawl today uh, because of uh, a couple of players were out. It's one of our uh, our patrons' birthdays tomorrow. Um, Brooke is celebrating her birthday, and so uh, we're taking the day off from dungeon crawl. We'll come back next week. Uh, yeah, man, I hear you, Brent. That's what I'm up to, too. A lot of work on a lot of different projects. Lots of iron in the fire. Mm, yeah. I was kind of Jose when I mentioned that we haven't really been doing a lot of streaming because of uh, Game of Thrones. Which, by the way, just as a fair warning to everyone, I have not watched since season five. I'm sort of a books first fan, so I'm waiting to continue watching the show until the books come out. Um, yeah, I will. Brooke is great. Um... So just keep that in mind that I would love to not be spoiled about Game of Thrones. I know it's over now and so people feel like they can talk about it. But like, please, for the sake of this stream, let's try to keep spoilers out. Not that anyone would, but just fair warning. I haven't seen it since a long time ago, since like season five. Uh, great. Cool. Let's dive in. Um, so we're going to talk about some really broad strokes world building today. I don't know if any of you have watched Matt Colville's streams uh, for his uh, his campaign, at least his world building streams, um, but I'm going to take some cues from him in terms of coming up with a campaign setting uh, with a group of people. So I never had a chance to do that. Oh great! Oh no, I'm sorry, Jack. Did you have some D and D drama? I know what that's like. Ugh, gross. Um, yeah, Jose, what's your question? Oh yeah. Listen, Jose, I wish that I could turn off my DM mind. I don't know if any of you guys have this problem, but I always constantly think that way. So I'll try. I'll try my damnedest, but I'm not making any promises because that's just how I think. Um, 
hey, thanks, Adam, for coming and hanging out, even though you're currently playing. Uh, the dwarves represent, buddy. Uh, but yes, as uh, as Adam pointed out, um, this campaign is going to be about dwarves. Dwarves have always been uh, really uh, critical to my enjoyment of fantasy uh, ever since The Hobbit when I was a kid. Um, and The Hobbit is actually one of the big touchstones we're going to go uh, for this campaign. But um, yeah, as though we need more D&D that's based on Tolkien, I know. That's the one thing that like has kept me from getting too excited about this is I'm worried that it's just like yet another Tolkien derivative. Like how many more of those do we need? But I feel like one thing Tolkien always kind of elides over, with obviously the exception of The Hobbit, is sort of dwarven culture and dwarven life. He's so concerned about the elves and the men, especially in Lord of the Rings, that you know Gimli being sort of the one token dwarf character, we don't really get to double down on what the dwarves are about and what their thing is. So I wanted to run a game that put dwarves in the, uh, in the spotlight and highlighted how interesting and like problematic they might be as a culture and all the interesting like uh, fallout from that. So, the general campaign concept that I'm going to run, um, I have a little uh, log line here. Sworn to an upstart monarch, the players help rebuild an ancient kingdom of dwarves, exploring sunken cities, establishing trade routes, conquering holdfasts, and navigating thorny dwarven politics, kingdom making at its finest. So my, basically my inspiration was what happens in The Hobbit after Bilbo goes home? How did the dwarves sort of pick up the pieces and rebuild Erebor uh, now that sort of the wars have been fought and the, uh, the kingdom has been reclaimed? What is it like to rebuild, to ever deign to rebuild Erebor and make it into the sort of thriving dwarven uh, uh, bastion in the north? Um, there are two kind of interesting things I wanted to talk about, uh, about the, that make this campaign unique. Um, I'm going to try to do something I've wanted to do for a long time. This is basically going to be the, the campaign that I run post Yog, so hopefully it will be podcasted, uh, like Yog is currently being podcasted. But what I'd like to try to do is kind of highlight it here. I would like to try to, I've always wanted to run a campaign that had two parties operating in it at the same time. Uh, not necessarily two different, uh, not in two different universes, two different timelines, in the same timeline. So ideally, I would have six players, is what I'm thinking right now, three and three, and then have kind of a, a rotating roster of guests come in to fill those fourth slots in both the two parties, but have their focuses be very bifurcated. So you have one party that is all about combat and dungeoneering and going into these ancient tombs and vaults and things and excavating them um, for use, and then you have one that is more role-playing or political focus that's about the kingdom building and the alliances and the scheming and the backstabbing and all that stuff. And then, of course, you'd every once in a while have the adventures where they team up or where they sort of cross paths or their, their members get all mixed or whatever you want. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Uh, no, so I'm not technically running it in... Uh, so I just looked at, looked at the chat. Um, Jose says we should make the dwarves below a Mediterranean volcano active archipelago. That's interesting. Yeah, I have a little bit of geography figured out, but nothing too too concrete. I like the idea of, that's one of the things we're going to talk about today, what makes a culture quintessentially dwarven without necessarily just ripping off um, uh, what's going on. Hey, Rejo, what's up? Thanks for coming in. Um, Jack asks, interesting concept, is it going to be in Middle Earth? There's a few books for Middle Earth games. No, it is not going to be set in Middle Earth, but that's definitely where I'm... Uh, pulling a lot of my inspiration from for this game um we're setting it in on dune which is the setting that's used for all hell yog but it's uh in a different time period than yog is set it's set earlier so yog is not really a, a force or a presence in the world right now it's set about a thousand years before that so if you are listening to our campaign um some of the world building notes will be the same but we're in a different part of the world kind of a different corner uh very similar to what uh mercer is doing with his new with the second campaign um, and yes, I'm going to try, Jose, to do the two parties. It may not be possible. It may become difficult. I have some plans of how to keep sort of the time stream uh, consistent because that's the one thing I've heard about people trying to run two parties in one world is that how do you keep them on sort of the same track? I'm hoping to use some downtime. But we will get into that later. Uh, today we're going to talk about the broad strokes. I wanted to talk about dwarven gods and dwarven culture. Again, kind of taking a cue from uh, Matt Colville and the way that he world built his city of capital. So here's what we know so far. Um, I have a lot of campaign ideas. If you guys have any ideas or thoughts or suggestions, please just shout them out and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, so the setting is established. It is, uh, the name is Coombe. I sort of uh, crowdsourced this a while ago. I got, took a couple of different people's ideas and combined them together. I wanted something that was like short and simple and primal, but it had a very deep and resonant sound. So we went with Coombe. Um, so K-H-U with the little carrot M. Uh, it's currently called the Reclaimed Kingdom. 
But it's the homeland of the dwarves in this world. Uh, the world is about 4,000 years old uh, at the time of Yogg. It'll be about 3,000 years old at the time of the campaign. Um, and it is sort of an isolated corner of the world. Uh, it's in the, the northeastern continent, which in my world is called Rubicos, um, which is kind of a rugged, highly forested, highly mountainous area, kind of a North America sort of a vibe. Um, a lot of nat- rich in natural resources, but also rich in danger. Um, it has kind of an alpine sort of climate. And so there's one corner of this continent that's sort of sealed off by these huge mountain passes. It's all got, got kind of a, a like the three or four different mountain passes that come together and like into this into this crossroads, this intersection. So it's sealed off from the rest of the continent, and that's kind of the homeland or the heartland of the dwarves, where they began as a people. Um, you know, they built these incredible structures. I want I want the dwarven aesthetic to be all about their works and their great architecture. So it's almost like the landscape of Coombe is dotted with aqueducts and giant statues and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but the broad strokes history is that they were, you know, reigned for 2,000 years and were great and powerful and built all of these wonderful uh, uh, wonders of the world, right? Um, yeah, Jack, go ahead and check it out. If you're still on The Child... You got a lot to catch up on, man. The Child Watch Tower and the Instrument. Yeah, we're, we're uh, just in the middle of the Instrument right now. We released episode five of that, which you've not been listening to. I, I recommend go check them out. They're really short episodes. It's a lot of fun. Um, I do not know about Mist. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Mist, like that's not like the video game. I assume, like the old CD-ROM game. Um, after two thousand years of prosperity the dwarves kind of underwent this, like, uh, chain reaction of cataclysms, these terrible tragedies that they call the Seven Sorrows, sort of one right after another. And by the end of this sort of cataclysmic period, Coombe had fallen as a kingdom. The dwarves are scattered, um, their halls are empty, uh, the veins have run dry, there's nothing there. So for about 500 years of exile and a sort of dereliction and abandonment, um, one particular dwarven adventurer, an important NPC in the campaign, um, called Harada Hornwinder, um, finds a way into some of the old halls in one of the great like dwarven uh, cities and manages to activate an artifact. I'm thinking it's going to be like a big horn that summons the dwarves back. And so now after some time has passed, the sorrows are kind of fading and the things that had driven them out are, are either now able to be challenged or able to be overcome, or at least Harada thinks they are, and is going to try to make a bid to bring the Dwarven Kingdom back. So the conceit then is that the heroes are in some way summoned or connected or hired by, I'm not sure exactly what their connection to the Dwarven uh, Queen will be, um, to come and assist in this. And so it's somewhat Game of Thrones, and that's sort of a power struggle. You have um, these various different Dwarven Lords who are all summoned back, are kind of contending with each other to try to claim the kingship. Um, because again, if you, you make sort of a Game of Thrones comparison, it's almost as though the Targaryen family never came back, right? The Targaryens, they're like reigning dwarven monarchs, were destroyed or lost in the, uh, in the sorrows. And now it's kind of a, an open question as to which dwarven clan will rule. Of course, there are seven dwarven clans, there are seven sorrows, because seven has to be our watchword. I want to use a lot of established mythological beats without necessarily being sort of tired or played out like i like seven being an important number it's for no other reason than just the seven dwarves right it's the way we think of them it's a number we associate with them i like playing into those like rich mythological veins um yeah so jack has a question here oh boy (laughs) brent's going for clam fair yeah check it out it's a good episode um oh interesting i didn't realize there was so much mythology to mist that's cool jose jack asks um do you have a theme for the sorrows? Like, were they all geological or monsters, invaders, a mix of both? It's definitely a mix of both. Um, Brent's ahead. Like, he's still still going in. Uh, so he's reading about these seven sorrows. We have seven of them. I tried to put them in the order that sort of made sense to me, but they could obviously be moved around. Um, so we have a, the volcano explodes. There is one of the dwarven settlements is sort of based around this, like, huge active volcano, and they use the heat of the magma to help them in their forges and whatever. Um, think very gauntal grim, right, with the fire primordial. But the volcano explodes, and this causes a sort of a, a, a nuclear winter-style effect, a geological event over the region. But then after the time in which they would assume that the seasons would resume, the winter just persists and persists and persists. Um, my thought was in this sort of brings in 
white dragons. I was imagining one white dragon in particular, because um, you want to have that sort of smog vibe, but you don't want to exactly just say, here's a red dragon. Um, moves in and starts terrorizing the area. I assume that also potentially brings in frost giants or emboldens frost giants who are in the region. Um, troglodytes, I feel like, are from beneath in the mines. Um, and then you have... Uh, uh, there's basically, as I mentioned, the Targaryen sort of idea. I wanted to have there be a, a kingly clan of dwarves that has been ruling Coom for however many generations. And it's almost like a gold sickness or a madness overcomes them. And it drives them mad. and start to make crazy decisions that the other dwarves can't countenance. Um, I have an idea about them and their wealth that I think is kind of interesting and what happens to them. Um, and then the veins run dry, which I think is like the, the final death stroke. They can no longer find the goods to keep the economy going, and they're sort of forced to leave Coom. Um, so that's those are the ones I have right now. They could definitely move around. There's a couple of them that I don't feel particularly inspired by. Like I definitely want the dragons around. I like the idea of frost giants, but I don't know that that's like the most interesting. Like just another group. I like troglodytes arising from the tunnels, that there's a threat from above and a threat from below. So that it, that's one of the big enemy groups that you would encounter if you're going through these dungeons, are these like ravenous hordes of troglodytes. Um, let's see. Can I suggest changing the veins run dry to rock grows almost unmindably hard? Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure what the specifics on it are. Um, but the conceit, conceit just being that they run out of mithril or iron or copper or whatever it is that they're mining, right? That like almost universally the various different mines dry up, quote unquote. Um, what's the uh, what's the thought process behind that, Jose? So sorry to answer uh, uh, Brent's questions. My first two questions: Is the dragon still there somewhere? Definitely. I kind of imagined that maybe it was like a big. Um, female dragon that came in and then ended up setting up a nest somewhere and has now had hatchlings and so there are a couple of just like adolescent white dragons that are flying around um, and causing problems because enough time in Undune uh, has passed for those uh, eggs to have hatched and become uh, full-fledged dragons the trogs are definitely still a threat um, I don't imagine they're using diplomacy although that's kind of interesting I'd imagine the trogs as being a little bit more mindless than that but the notion of, like, one of the dwarven uh, clans attempting to negotiate with the trogs is kind of cool. I like that. Um, goblins are also big in the area, but I didn't feel like goblins are uh, a big enough threat to really challenge them too much. Um, but please, continue asking questions about sorrows and stuff like that. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, I want to move on a little bit just to talk a little bit more about what we wanted to discuss today. Talk about the broad strokes. Um... So we're going to talk about gods, we're going to talk about culture is the main thing that's on the docket for today. Because I want to establish like the dwarven mindset to help establish what the dwarven civilization would be like and then why it would fall and how to design campaigns and stuff around it like that. I like to start big. I know you're supposed to start small with like, here's a village. But I'm at the point now where I'm more interested in setting the tone of the location and setting the tone of the political situation before I start to, to figure out exactly how the campaign's going to run. But that's just me. You guys might run it differently. Um, so the world that we're playing in, the world that uh, Yogg is set in, is called Undune, and it has a very particular style of uh, divinity. Rather than the sort of Forgotten Realms model, or even the Eberron model, where there are um, lots and lots and lots of different deities, um, there are, Undune has six gods, um, and these are, I call them the Prime Pantheon. And they are very distant in sort of a deist sense. They are believed to have created the world, and they still lend power and things like that to clerics and paladins and divine uh, spellcasters. But they no longer directly interfere. It seems as though they, it's believed that they created the earth to try to contain Yogg inside of it. And then they departed and left the world to its own creation. And it's an open question as to whether or not when you die, you go to join the gods or what happens to you. It's not really 100% known. People who come back from the dead either have shaky memories or have no memory of what, uh, what they experienced in death. So, but these six gods are undeniably real, and they, they exist in all of the religions uh, on the planet, with a couple of ex exceptions for sort of monstrous religions or whatever. But the conceit is that each uh, culture, each sort of race, interprets these six gods differently. And in their own stories and mythology, they have developed personalities that are distinct. Um, I have these six gods as mapping to the ability scores. So we have the god of strength, and the god of dexterity, and the god of constitution, and the god of intelligence, and wisdom, and charisma. Um, but then depending on which culture you're in, those different gods might represent different things. So I know for a fact that the elven god of strength is a god of swordplay, 
whereas the one of the halfling gods of strength is a god of labor. Um, and so the notion was to come up with what would the dwarves what values would the dwarves have? How would they describe their gods? How would they take these core values, the strength, dex, constitution, all of that, and interpret them in kind of a dwarven context? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, as well as then the culture that comes out of that, right? Do we start, we can potentially start with, start with culture and say what are important to dwarves and why, and then extrapolate from there their gods. I have some ideas already, but we can kind of refine them together as we go through. Cool, so that's kind of the docket. Let me look at chat uh, for a sec. Let's see, let's see. Um, if the volcano explodes, one of the things that can follow is the lava going up and covering the rock. Yeah, I like that. That's cool. So one of the things I had imagined is that the the volcano city, um, which is, again, imagine this is a kingdom. So there are many large cities and, and sort of smaller holdings and stuff, is basically paved over with molten rock. I think that's cool. Um, given the volcanic activity, it would mean some kind of seismic activity, and mines are often mined in a way that could be unstable. Yeah, so a lot of them could have collapsed. I think that's cool. Um, excellent. Uh, maybe the trogs have some way to soften the stone, making mining easier. The dwarves would have to deal with them to get to the process. Oh, huh. That's kind of cool. That's, that feels like an interesting plot. Yeah, and that's cool too, Brent. I like that. Maybe, maybe the veins didn't run dry, but the dwarven gods hid the veins, right? And that's I think, could be an open question too, that like some of them would see that as being an omen, right? Why can't we get an access to this anymore? The gods have cursed us. And it's not 100% clear whether it's a geological event or a magical event or a religious event. But I definitely think that there would be dwarven priests who would interpret it as that. Um, well, Jack, that's a great question. Uh, you definitely can... Uh-oh, here comes Vaughn. Hey, Vaughn. Look at all these people in the chat today. This is awesome. Um, yes, Jack, you can get access to... Oh, this one I haven't shared quite yet with the, uh, the patrons, but with our previous uh, streams, if you are a patron, you have access to the design documents that we're working with. So if you want to go ahead and join our Patreon, uh, you can get access to these. I will share this document. Um, maybe I'll do it right now, actually. Um, let's see. Because then if you, want, if you are a patron, you can go and take a look at them. Anyone with the link can comment. And I will go and I will put that into our Patreon post. I just posted about it on Patreon. Oh, no, you're going to see all my all my secrets. Let's get back. Okay. So I'm going to do that real quick. You guys keep talking. But, yes, today we're going to talk about uh, the gods and the culture of Kum, the reclaimed kingdom. It's awesome to see so many people in the chat. Yeah, I was seeing this point we were running the... Uh, Secrets. We were running the uh, the streams on Sundays, and because Game of Thrones was just uh, sucking up our viewership, it, it kind of came down to three or four people every week. So it's nice to get like a bigger group. And I thought too, with a fresh start, right, doing something new with the world building, uh, it would be a little bit more accessible. Great. So as I said, I'm waiting for this to load. Let's maybe talk about cultural values first, and then kind of delve into um, gods from there. Um, so I made a short list of things that I feel like the dwarves value above all, and things that are interesting to me about dwarves and what I think they value and what I think that they frown upon. I think an important thing to keep in mind with these two is that, and this is something Matt Colville talked about, there is a distinction between what someone says they value and what they actually value and things they say you're not supposed to do and, what, and how they actually act. So I think some of the fun can come from the dwarven cultural idea is that blah, blah, blah. But in practice... You know, they're much more likely to do this and that and that. Like, in American culture, right, there's kind of a, a stigma against overeating. You know, that, that culturally you're supposed to be fit and you're supposed to be athletic and you're supposed to eat well and all these things and stay active. But that's not really what we do, is it, right? Like, a lot of people eat junk food and a lot of people have these sort of weight problems. As much as the culture is telling us that we need to look a certain way by our media, the way we actually look is very different, right? And our, and our culture is kind of saying contradictory things. And that's what I think could be interesting is delving into what does the dwarven culture think about itself and what is the dwarven culture actually? And how do other people view dwarves based on their actual behavior? Um, let me post this in. Follow along as we design a brand, a brave new world. Sorry, just adding that to our Patreon. So if you are a patron um, and you want to see our document, I just added it. Uh, patrons only. 
I'm going to update it in just a second, and then you can come and check it out. Confirm. Patrons only save. Great. Check it out. This is the same world. Uh, oh, look at you guys talking to each other. Yes, this is on Dune. It's the same world as Yogg, but it's about a thousand years before, and correct. And there is some dim hope for survival. So yeah, um, people who are curious about the interrelation, this is a thousand years before, as I mentioned. We're in the third age rather than the fourth age, and Yogg has yet to be awakened. Yogg is still there. Yogg is still imprisoned, but its influence is substantially lessened. So this is sort of during the several thousand years of Yogg's plotting. Uh, I don't want to 100% confirm. You know what, though? Here's the thing, is that if you are coming to this stream and you're here with me, you're on the DM side. So one of the things I, uh, if you look at the history of Undoom, which you can find on our wiki, um, at the end of the Second Age, which is when the calamities would have occurred, um, the sorrows would have occurred, there were sort of widespread calamities all across the globe. Um, it's not 100% confirmed in world, but my thinking was always, this is one of Yogg's attempts to destabilize the Earth. Uh, Yogg is primarily imprisoned, or the weakest point of the seal is in Aros, the sort of center continent, and that continent is racked by earthquakes. My thought being Yogg is attempting to sort of burst its way out. And so the Seven Sorrows, the volcanic explosions, are almost indirectly or directly tied to Yogg in some way. But again, I don't think Yogg is a real concern for this campaign. Yogg is kind of off and sealed away and a far away threat. But that's a good, important uh, point to make. Uh, great. So I think the things that are most important to me about dwarves, and I think are most interesting to me about them as characters and as a race, um, is the work and is the idea of them as craftspeople and as artists. And so I think one of the most important uh, values for dwarves are is creation, right? And um, specifically like craftsmanship, craftsmanship, artistry and sort of care and devotion to that creation, right? I think that, like, even sort of the lowliest, um, meanest dwarf still considers themselves an artisan on some level, right? Um, they care about genius, and they care about design and function, you know? They're all about uh, uh, grace and beauty, yes, but they're also about... Um, um, how effectively something works for what it's supposed to do. They're engineers, right? They're not just artists, but they're engineers. So I think it's all about, I like to think of them as being, I mean, I think one of the reasons I connect with them on that level is I consider myself an artist, right? So the idea of like constantly working on something and always thinking about their next project. They have a difficult time interrelating with other people, but they're very good at, because they're always thinking about their, their next work, right? They're artists and creators first, and they're sort of people second. I think that that's really important for dwarves, that it's always about, ooh, perfection is good, perfectionists. Um, they're always about the next best thing they could be working on or their, their next projects. You can talk to my fiance about this, but I have exactly that kind of mind where I don't really think about people so much as I think about what I'm working on and, and the next, as soon as I'm finished with one thing, or as soon as I've thought about something enough, I'm on to the next. And I feel like the call, I wanted to have almost uh, an Egyptian sort of sense of great work and great uh, achievements being all stonework and being all architecture and these monuments, that that's how you show that you cared about something and that's how you show your devotion is that you etch it into stone, you make it material, right? They show their glory and their worth by what they make and what they leave behind, even more than who they are as people. Like the individual dwarf isn't as important as the thing the dwarf has made. Um, yeah. Hey, welcome, uh, Neve. Nice to see you. Mm, mm, that's great. Yeah, I love that, friend. I get the feeling that if dwarves played D&D, &D, they'd be all about system mastery. They lived for centuries. They would put in all the time into mastering one skill. Exactly, right? That they would be all about the power builds and what's the most effective way to do it. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, but I still think that their um, system of criticism laws... Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm going to put a thing, I'm just going to put down random ideas, so criticism, law, um, specific regulations about it, like, almost like slander on some level, that like saying something, that they take, like, it's, it, the sort of libel laws apply to someone's work more than they apply to an individual person. 
Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and just hit the other points, but let's let's keep them all in the mix. I would love to talk about like different uh, uh, elements of these. Like, shout out whatever ideas you have. Um, so the other thing that I think is important to them is defense. Um, th in terms of their warfare, I don't think that the dwarves in Undune are very aggressive. I think that they are all about holding up and protecting themselves. Like the their ideal sort of video game experience is like a tower defense game, right? They are less about campaigning and conquering anyone as they are about fortification and strengthening where they are. They want to work on their projects and the idea of anyone attacking them or disrupting them is very harmful. So they're all about, um, almost like immobility is a big thing, right? That they want to be stationary, stationary and protected, of course, and fortified. I think that dwarven generals and war leaders take a lot of pride in, in making their fortresses impregnable. Um, the dwarven sort of weapon of choice, I think, more than the axe or the hammer is the shield. Like, they will wield both axes and hammers, especially hammers too, I think, because you, know, you have that sort of smith-like uh, uh, mason connotation to them. But I think the shield represents the, the more the dwarven eye to war, warfare and warcraft. They are all about defense and protection and keeping the enemy out. Like, let the enemy break itself on your fortification rather than you going out and leading a campaign against them, right? Um, and I think a lot of that is because, you know, they are s stout and strong and whatever, but they're also slow. <laughs> that, like, they're not raiders. They're not um, Vikings. They're all about holding up inside their fortresses. So then what, what do you spin out from that? If they're about defense and they're about fortification, then they are about... Um, strength is the wrong word, but, like... Trying to think of culturally, what are the values that sort of trickle down from that? I mean, longevity is here, right? So then I think it's about like how like timelessness and tradition on some level, right? Like stubbornness, great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Thank you, Adam. Stubborn. Bulwark is great. Hmm. Can you imagine all those dwarves caring for layered armors to block concussions? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but they would. I think they would care a lot about armor, right? Armor is really important to them. Um, shield is the um, iconic dwarven weapon. Armor is of supreme importance. Or, yeah, let's put that in here. Thank you, Adam. That was a good hit on Stubborn. I don't know why that didn't occur to me. Bulwark is good. Uh, Vaughn says, here's my suggested linking of creation and defense. Creations and ideas must be able to stand up to scrutiny. An idea that, fall, that fails to withstand review is reviled. Yeah, I think that's cool. And that kind of goes into the criticism, right, um, that you were talking about. That, like, you have to be able to kind of poke it and, and, and examine it. And it's, it's something that you... Like, like, the idea of someone making something haphazardly, especially, like you know, uh, a poor weapon or a poor uh, uh, gate or a poor, even something small, right? Like a poor hammer um, is one thing. But I also even think that like intellectually that like they, 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 play, they like reward planning and they reward, reward design and architecture as opposed to, you know, sort of a more spontaneous, like passionate, uh, response to something, right? That like an elf, I think, kind of reacts emotionally, whereas like a dwarf is very cerebral and all about how it's designed and how it holds together and like everything is load bearing, right? Um, my friend Alan always talks about how I care when I like watching a movie, I care a lot about like the structure of the whole and the screenplay and how it all works within itself. I don't care about individual details and flourishes so much. If the whole thing doesn't stand on its own, then I think it's bad. And I feel like that's also a very dwarven mindset that you have to take the whole of it. And if there are weak points or there are flaws, then that diminishes the whole value. You can't take pride in any small part of it if the whole thing is weak. That's kind of out there. But again, I think thinking about their like uh, uh, mindset really helps me. Coincidentally, very similar to my own mindset. I wonder why I want to run this game. Okay, yeah. Uh, Brent is a good point here. Defense feels like it would take two different paths. Defense of the nation, monuments, projects, and the more personal level of defense of family, physically, morally, reputation. Yeah, okay. Um, that's cool. Defense for two facets. Like, um, 
defensive country, country of clan of uh, works slash defense of person, family, reputation. I think like history is in there too, right? That like history, the defense of their history and their reputation is interesting to me because I think they do care a lot, and we'll get this get to this in a second. They do care a lot about tradition and longevity and like uh, toughness or like how long something can survive, right? Like a monument that has stood for a thousand years has more value to a dwarf than like because it, it's built to last, right? Um, let's see what else have we got. Single mindedness is good. Oh, huh. Who, uh, who made that secret weapon for the Hero of the Shield? Uh, have them hate any kind of apology. That would mean one could hurt the other's inner defense and also would show weakness on that person they offer. There's something interesting about that, that they're not about apologies, right? Because they, like, they're stubborn, too. So they stand behind their thing. And I feel like they hold grudges, right? Like, they don't really um, forgive very well. So I feel like, yeah, that's interesting. Um... Okay, let me make a point about... I'm not sure where that would go. I'll put, like, miscellaneous. Dwarves don't apologize. It weakens themselves and their position. Yeah, Adam says single-mindedness, which I think is good, too. I think they are... Uh, ooh, inflexible. Stubborn, yes, but I think also like they're resistant to new ideas and to innovation. And that could be under longevity too. Toughness, resistant to new ideas and innovation. We got some great stuff going here, guys. Um, okay, what is, let's see. Jack says, could make use of the Battle Rage in the Forgotten Realms or something similar to that, a means of contesting the defensive stance, a last resort when they absolutely have to attack. That's cool. I always liked the Dwarven Defender from 3rd Edition, where they almost enter, like, a rage, but it's it's called, like, defensive stance, where they, they can't move, their speed becomes zero, but they get, like, crazy bonuses to AC and they get reaction stuff. Like, I think they do have, like, forms of war. Like, the Phalanx is a huge thing for them, uh, tactically, right? They invented the shield wall. They invented the Phalanx. Dwarves invented the phalanx, the shield wall. It's like all about making the enemy crash against you, right? That you stand still, and the orcs or the like, it wouldn't be orcs in this case, but the goblins or the trogs just break against them. Um, single mindedness is great. Um, I'm trying to figure out where that is. It's kind of in here. Single mindedness. Uh, so a lot of my ideas too came from. If you guys haven't read Mordenkainen's, there's a lot of uh, Tome of Foes. There's a lot of really good ideas in there. I took some some notes from that when I was thinking about this and prep for today. Um, and they make a good point about like dwarves are always concerned about protecting their holdfasts or whatever their their halls, but they you know are so single minded in the way they think that a lot of times they will make one plan and stick to that plan, even if that plan isn't the best, or even if the enemy has innovated a way around that plan. So I think that like, you almost get sort of a Russian czar in the 1800s thing, where they refuse to mechanize, they refuse to adapt their tactics in ways that could prove disastrous for them, right? That like, against certain kinds of enemies, they are woefully ill-equipped, and they don't really want to change their tactics, because their tactics are their tactics. Um, I'm behind, I'm behind, I'm behind, okay. Um, Rejo says, the dwarves have their work scrutinized by the community. Everyone has to submit criticism of the work and those who consistently earn good reviews. Oh, that's cool. It's like meritocracy, but based on um, work, right? That like, yeah, that's cool. Um, criticism. Well-reviewed artists gain more tangible benefit that it's like it isn't just like oh you're a good artist or a creator it's like you know um they're more highly i'm trying to figure like how that would translate but the notion of of influence and stuff rising or falling in the community based on how people think of your work or crafts people influence in society um after surviving peer review so like are there people because i like this idea too like i guess all dwarves would feel this way like 
This is what's interesting, I think, about the way we consume media as, as Americans anyway. I don't know about if you're from another country, but being an American, um, is that everyone has their own opinions about you know whether a movie is good or bad or whether an actor is good or bad or whether a book is good or bad or whether the book or the movie is better. That like, Is that a thing with dwarven culture where everyone is a critic? Everyone can look at art and say, this is what I think about that or this is improperly done or you know their, their methods for this were, were, were shoddy. Or are there people in dwarven society that are critics, right? And those people have this sort of almost secret uh, uh, position that like you're a, a carving critic or you're a, um, a smithing critic or whatever. And they go around and they can examine weapons and like they make their money, they make their livelihood by saying this is good and that's bad. That's interesting, but I feel like it also takes the power away from the dwarves themselves. And I feel like they, I don't know, the notion of someone who makes money on that We'll get into this later about good, bad, and good wealth and bad wealth in dwarven society. But I'd be curious about like what is the role of the critic? We're getting like really like existential right away, which I think is fascinating and, and awesome. I love that. But like we're going right into like what is the role of art in dwarven society, as opposed to like dwarves have beards. Um, okay, cool. So Brent says an idea from the uh, oh that's um, Guy Gabriel K right. Uh, the Dwarven King must create something and present it to a guardian spirit. If it is accepted, the king may rule. If it isn't, the su supplicant is driven mad. Huh. Yeah, I think there's something, I think there's a lot about creation in there. I'm not sure about the spirit. We can figure it out. But I think there's something cool about that, about like bad creation having tangible effects. Almost societally, yes, but also like on the Dwarven psyche. Like if you make something bad or you go long too long without making something, you know, you have some kind of a, of a psychological effect. That's interesting. Yeah, making the means of scrut making the system of scrutiny a means of dividing castes. It would be interesting, is what Jack says. Uh, Vaughn says, going back to tactics, uh, I wonder if dwarves can never retreat, or if they are flexible in their defense. Could dwarves retreat into dangerous territory, knowing they can endure their foes, their foes not? I think they could. I think that would be like a revolutionary battle general, right? They're like someone who suggests a retreat. Um, seems like a bad idea. Like, what do you mean falling back? But then it turns out, like, because they thought ahead, like, oh, the dwarves are strong and they can hide in the mountains, they can do this, right? That, like, I think they can, but I think that, like, those are... I feel like every once in a while in dwarven society, they have these, like, big watershed moments where they realize, like, oh, we should have been thinking about this wrong. Like, when they first adopted ranged weapons, they realized that, like, oh, the crossbow, right? If we use arrow slits, boom, it's this huge moment that, like, changes everything about dwarven society. That, like, you can hide behind something, you can do blah, 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 blah. But I think that takes them a really long time compared to how long it would take elves or especially humans to adapt to some of these ideas. Um, yeah, and Adam says, yes, the old ways are the best ways, definitely. It's that kind of baby boomer era, like back in the old good old days, it was blah, 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 right? For good or for ill. Um, Jack Rugg met some death metal, a uh, song called Shield Wall. I'm sure it's got some Norse undertones because that's a very Norse thing. Um, some meritocracy has gone extreme. Could be cool for the critic system. The older and more creative and productive member of society would have a bigger vote. Yeah. I mean, I do think they have, essentially have like a feudalistic society. They have like a dwarf king. But I feel like the aristocracy could be determined by who are the best artists and who have made the best things, right? Um, I think they never abandon their creations. See, that's interesting to me because this is an idea that I had. I wasn't sure how to... Because I think there's two, there's two different ways you could go here. I think you could have them either... Like, never abandon their creations in the sense of, like, once you make something, it's yours in a way that, like, a child would be. Or, I think you could have the inverse effect of, like, dwarves who, the minute they make something, they move on to something else. Right? Like, th that's, to me, how I work as an artist, is that once I have created something, I, I the maintenance of it is less interesting to me. Because I think we can talk about greed in a little bit here, too. But I think that that is tied into that notion of like do you persist do you maintain it seems like they could i don't think that would be undwarven of them but i also like the idea of the the dichotomy if i spent so much time working on this and i cared about it so much that then when i have a new idea it gets abandoned and this thing that i did care about is no longer important to me and it kind of falls into decay and so the dwarves are always kind of like jumping to the next thing right it doesn't feel super stuck in the old ways but that feels very artist to me so there might be some kind of a middle ground there um. Yeah, Adam. Oh man, that was perfect, dude. That was my favorite thing about Morton Kynan. This I love the idea that drinking brings the memories more to the fore, and that's why drinking is so important to them. That it's not about forgetting your memories; it's about 
like uh, reliving them. The dwarves have a different biological reaction to alcohol than humans do, and that while it's similar, right, like dwarves in groups will drink together and have this like ro roisterous good time, but a dwarf who drinks alone is more likely to revisit old memories and be kind of surly. I thought that was like absolute genius and something I definitely want to incorporate here. That's the perfect use of it. Um, Vaughn says, I would say everyone's a critic. I like that too. Part of learning your culture is critiquing the past. I'm into that. I think that's better. Um, an accent is a big thing that helps distinguish cultures and ethnicities from one another. Have you thought of one for these dwarves? Um, we touch on it just a little bit in um, the Watchtower. They meet a dwarf. Um, so, and I don't, what I'm trying to do with Undo is I'm trying not to tie individual accents in this world to like actual accents in the, in, on Earth, successfully and unsuccessfully sometimes. Anyone who's listened to the instrument knows that my halflings are just sort of like Northern England or like sort of West Country England. Um, side story, I'm basing those halflings on uh, one actor who plays, um, I think he's in the movie, but in the uh, 1981 BBC audio drama version of Lord of the Rings, he plays Butterbur, the bar, the like uh, bartender at the Prancing Pony. And he just has this very particular sort of voice and that's what I'm going to base all my halflings on. And so that's like the one time when I just like in the corner got pushed into that. But even then with that, with that accent, I'm trying to just like throw some Wisconsin in there, a little bit of like uh, um, Midwestern stuff. So the Dwarven, so to answer your question, the Dwarven accent I've kind of been doing is a little Germany, a little bit, it's sort of all back here. It has a, a deep fallback kind of voice where it's not 100% German, but it has a deep resonance all the way down. There's maybe a couple of German V's for W's here and there. But it's about finding like the right level of how German, how Nordic, how Scottish do you want to go. But it's it's all back in, in the back of the throat is sort of what I'm going with right now. Where the elves I'm doing are very like forward and very breathy as opposed to all the way back for dwarves. But that's still undetermined. Okay, I'm way, way behind. Um, I like Adam's idea. Maybe something the brewing process involves a racial memory component. Racial memory is huge for that too, I think. It isn't even just your deeds. Like you can remember the deeds of dwarves past. It's great. Everyone has a vote. That to be cast up or down. Yeah, ruled by Reddit. That's very funny. Um, but I think that's all social. I don't think it's anything like embedded in the culture, but I think it's like, yeah, that like public opinion of your work is very important, right? And for, again, like for good or for ill, um, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, dwarves have to create, they have to build, or they diminish. That's good. Cool. So I'm into that. Um, dwarves must build, must create, or they diminish. Slash go mad. I don't know if they go mad, but they like, they like lose their fat. Almost like they, I could see them having almost like an amnesia, not amnesia, like an Alzheimer's-y, like they, they start to forget names. They start to like lose their personality. I think diminish is actually a great way to describe that. Nice work, bud. Um, have medals for creations. <laughs> mm, yeah, I think that's interesting. Yeah, they have to get the thing right no matter how many times it takes. Yeah, I think that's cool. You have this perfectionism, right? I like the idea of them building this hammer and it looks gorgeous and beautiful and they've made it, but there's an imperfection. They throw the hammer and they start again, right? Like you have to do it until you get it. So maybe there is even this sense of paralysis because how often, I mean, what artist ever feels good with their creation that they're like, you will get dwarves that will spend their whole lives rebuilding one thing over and over and over again, right? Or constantly making like adjustments to it. Um, Vaughn says, random learning process thought, each generation starts with the old creation methods and has to discover the flaws of each process. Yeah, there's a generation by generation. Yeah, there's a generation where they're all about bronze, you know, and then eventually they discover like, oh, these are the problems with bronze. They figure out every possible way they can use bronze and then, uh, you know, silver or brass or electrum or whatever it is comes in as the new thing. So it's like generational by generational. And you can look, you can tell, and this is kind of true of our, our archaeology, but you can tell when something was built by looking at the methods. Like this particular style of art has like a deco feel. So this was from 300 years ago or whatever. This is from t two generations back. That's cool. Um, you can carbon date dwarven creations by the methods used. Um, how's Von phrase it particularly? Yeah, newer generations discover flaws or problems in old designs and update them. 
That's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you liked the the instrument episode, Adam. Yeah, there's I'm from Minnesota, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, Minnesotan influence in there for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Jack says his Knowles are, Knowles are Jamaican. Uh, I've done some African accents in some of my campaigns before. I'm trying to get away from them because I think I was younger when I did it, and I feel weird about it now. Um, but yeah, as recently as um, uh, a couple years ago, I ran. I did mer I like Jamaican merfolk, which like I really like doing that accent. I think it's fun to to like the sounds are fun to make, but I don't think it's like great to be like a white dude from Minnesota, especially because it's certainly not very authentic. Like I, this is one of the reasons I'm trying to stay away from like two very specific regional accents from my world because I think either they're boring or they're played out. Like how many times can you do a Cockney accent? Like I love to do them, but like I'm tired of them, right? Um, so I'm trying to come up with new accents or just like ways of speaking that aren't actually accents that I can use for my individual characters. But uh, Jose says uh, they make their status titles like journeyman master based on a forging steps, uh, like the lower. Of the oh, that's interesting. That it's like they're there because that, that's a question too. Like, do we have guilds? Do we have like who is? Because I could see there being like craftsmen's guilds and stuff that like determine your rank. That's more what I was wondering. Is that like. That's maybe more of a societal conversation to have, but I wonder, you know, if you are a smith, who are you? Are you just selling on the open market? Are you working inside of a guild structure? How do the dwarves do it? Um, Brent says, I like the idea that there's that this flood of precious dwarven creations heading out in trade, highly valued in the outside world. Yeah, totally, Brent. That was great. That's in, um, uh, uh, I think they hinted at it, at least in Mordenkainen's. There's a joke about, like, dwarves selling a defective shovel to a human, right? And then the human's like, oh, great, this will work. The dwarves like, haha, this will only work for a couple of decades, and it works for the rest of the human's life, right? So the idea that the inferior shitty products are sold, like somebody had that idea that these humans will buy this trash, this like tawdry stuff. And so let's jump ahead a little bit, and I wanted to talk about the notion of trade as being a vice. So here's my thought with the dwarves, um, that there is good wealth, and there is bad wealth. They're both necessary, and I think both dwar dwarves will engage in either one, but there are some, some money that is seen as being sort of legitimately God, and some money that is seen as being illegitimately God. So good wealth, in my opinion, in Roman society is mined. It's acquired by discovery and by um, uh, acquisition, like by personal acquisition. Unless it's like a rugged, like, I mined this, my dwarves, my people mined this wealth out of the earth, and that's considered legitimate. That's not how you spell acquisition. Leave me alone. Um, anything mined from the earth is considered more legitimate. Uh, considered more legitimate than anything bought or traded for. So then bad wealth is, is money like earned from trading or um, selling goods, especially to humans and other races. That like the notion of taking an inferior product, right? Like a, a bad shovel and selling it to humans and getting gold, that's considered low money. It's easy. Anybody could do that, right? The real money, the good money, comes from pulling the the gold out of the earth and stamping it into your own coins and saying this is pure. It's like pure and dirty money. So I think you get this interesting confluence then that like but the the, the dwarves need to trade. Like you can't live underground and get by on just the goods you can get underground, right? Where do you get your wool from? Where do you get your your like plants from? Where do you get your meat? And a bunch of other things, like they have to trade to exist. But I think the, the dwarven nobility or the dwarven like old money looks down on that stuff. That scene is seen as being less legitimate. It's seen as being tawdry. You're going out into the world to get money and you're, and you're selling inferior goods, right? You could sell the good stuff, but the, the, why wouldn't you sell that stuff to dwarves, right? So I've, and I, I love that dichotomy of like, so you almost get that sort of Colvillian like rising merchant class over time, but they're considered to be in dwarven society, not as good, not as legitimate as those dwarves who just like mint their own coins, right? Um, and dwarves sell their embarrassing mistakes. Yeah, mining is old money. That's exactly right. They value what they created, not what they buy or sell. Totally. Um, 
I use Electrum for secret societies who don't want to get gold to be traced back to them. That's cool. Interesting. Um, thoughts on longevity. Since dwarves are driven to create and critique, I suspect there's very long grudges to might be factions. Definitely. Lots of grudges. I think I've, almost you get that like um, uh, Tesla Edison. Like I feel like there are dw like ancient dwarven like like feuds are a big thing. I think with them, not like in sort of a passionate Romeo and Juliet kind of a way, but in this like long Cold War esque. Like these two clans have hated each other for you know thousands of years, and they never get along, and no one remembers why, and it's this ancient old. Well, maybe they do remember that. Like that's the point. Longevity grudges. I want to put grudges in there. Dwarves hold grudges forever and never let anything go. Um, rather than forgetting the slight, the reason for the slight, they always remember and tell themselves and teach their young, right? tell the stories of how they were wronged to their children. So these like these feuds go for generations and generations and generations. And maybe they get embellished, but it's never forgotten. It's never just like, oh, we hate the Capulets for whatever reason. It's it's important to them why they hate the Capulets, right? Uh, mining is old money. Yep, they value what they made. Uh, Adam says it could also serve as the duality of tragedy of the Seven Sorrows. The dwarves were craftsmen, and they were forced from their homes. And exa exactly, dude, that's perfect. So there's another thing I wanted to talk about um, uh, about this, where the uh, so the dwarves lived in Coombe, which is this like isolated little peninsula. I should be gesturing on this side. You can see it. The dwarves lived in Coombe, which is this isolated little peninsula on one corner of this continent. And then when the Seven Sorrows happened, they were pushed out of that area and had to go into like sort of the main part of the continent. And there were dwarves out there, but it's kind of the difference between like England and the 13 colonies, right? That like they're all colonial uh, uh, holdfasts and things. They're never as great or as grand as they were in England. But when the dwarves left Coombe, left England, um, and were pushed out in this huge refugee crisis, had to flee to these other places, the dwarves that were considered lesser, the 13 colonies, rose up and became more important. And so the great high dwarven clans that left out of the homeland now sort of became beggars and had to live in human cities and sell their services. And all they were so snooty and so above it all before that now that's one of the reasons I kind of rush back to Coom is to like reclaim where they used to be. The high dwarven clans become sort of the low clans, which I think, again, is this like great dichotomy of good of like good money versus bad money yeah you guys are like hitting all these notes that like i hadn't got to talk about yet but we we're able to refine them and that's awesome so it's good that we're great minds this is awesome um yeah they sell their embarrassing mistakes to get them out of sight but i think that's also considered kind of tawdry right like you don't want anyone to know that you made the mistakes and i could see like situations where certain houses get mocked or certain dwarves get mocked when it's discovered that like oh these humans have this inferior stuff from from clan battle hammer or whatever the hell the dwarven clan is called like i could see that being like a scandal um what if dwarves don't trade items among themselves because the first question a dwarf asks is what's wrong with it why don't you want to keep it exactly yeah i think they don't trade or as little as they can right doesn't involve creative work so of course it wouldn't be valued yep grudges are fixed uh until someone forgets and those are the ones that lose yeah 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 for sure oh that's interesting right that like I can see it, too, being that, like, you know, one of the great dwarven monomyths is about, like, the dwarf who was wronged at the beginning of time and held that grudge all the way up until sort of the present day and then finally pulled it out. While everyone else had forgotten, like, this dwarf remembered and finally got their revenge, and that's considered to be... He's the hero, right? The dwarf that remembered this ancient slight. Um, contact with other races is important to talk about, too. Uh Threatens what the dwarves find valuable. What wealth is has changed. It used to be what you were famous for. Now it's money. Yeah, exactly. That like they didn't really care about currency. But that's interesting too. Is that like they would have had to have existed for a while without contact. No dwarven items sold would have a family stamp. Yeah, if they have it, they must be gifted. And the receiver has to know the story. That's interesting. That like they would, if you're going to sell it out. Because I imagine there are some dwarven clans that specifically make shields and axes and picks to sell to human prospectors, but they don't want anyone to know, or they don't want to like put their name on it unless they're sort of a lower house. Like I like the idea of a of like an unscrupulous dwarven house that doesn't care about that and is is raking in the dough from trading with the humans, but everyone else kind of looks down on them, right? That this is the that that's they sold out. This is it's a low practice. Yeah, that's great. That's all good. 
Um, that's something we can all talk about in economy, which I have way down here. But it, yeah, we'll get there eventually. Cool, 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 cool. All great. Um, so I want to talk about family real quick. One of the things that I really liked about Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes in the dwarf section is they talked about the notion of children, dwarven children, essentially being creations or works, right? The reason the dwarves value their children, the reason the dwarves value family is that a child is sort of considered to be a dwarf's greatest work. It's something that they have handcrafted and it's something that they can shape into whatever they want. They change the world by the way they raise their children. So I think that children are seen as creations. Creations, works of art. And so in the same way that if you have a bad child, you have like a poorly behaved child, that is seen as a poorly made piece of equipment, a poorly made item, a poorly made artwork. Poorly raised children are seen as offensive. A poorly made, or as offensive, as poorly made works. Oh, that's cool. Sounds like a quest right there. Retrieve the stolen family relic where the dumb humans don't know its providence. Yeah, it turns out it was sold or something like that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so what I like about that is it like emphasizes the relationship between parent and child. Like parent and child relationship is way more important than like uh, brother, the like sibling relationship or husband and wife. That like if you make someone right and it's your responsibility to raise them then that's the the relationship that matters the most like dwarven society is built on parent child relationship um i read it ranking as your parenting skills yeah totally mm, i know we've been going down this line but what if the society were an egalitarian society where the whole works to support the great those great craftsmen that are rarely born so family are incredibly important because the larger your clan, the more likely. That's kind of cool. I like that. I mean, I think they're egalitarian in the sense... I do think that like we need some politics and we need some kings and queens and some nobility and like, some level of like rise and fall. But the notion of like... That's like, again, economically, right? Like, are they are they big communes? Is this like a big communist society where they're all about making the clan better? And then every once in a great while, like a... Uh, a hero essentially will be born because I think you could make a distinction between like a dwarven monarch and a dwarven hero or a dwarven like genius or whatever the term you want to call it is because I think you could have some interesting like uh, Aragorn Denethor conflict there right that like this clan might have a genius or might have someone that they claim to be a genius whatever the term a master craftsman or whatever a master um and then th they're at odds but it only happens once every ten generations or, or very infrequently right and so then when the master comes along, then there's this conflict between the ruling monarch and the master, right? Like that could be part of the aristocracy. It could be about like who's the best craftsman and what influence do they have? I think that's cool. I like the notion of like family being important, the paragon or whatever. Yeah, there's something cool with that. I, I don't want to scrap the notion of like royalty and monarchy entirely because I think that's important for the campaign. But societally, yeah, the notion of like egalitarian like that it's all about supporting the, the like every once in a great while they would have uh, I don't know where that would go put on miscellaneous and I think it's I think it's rare there's a master or hero born a craftsman craftsperson crafts dwarf of unusual and divinely inspired skill that rallies the community around them. You could even have them be like they were the founders of the clan, right? Of these, because I think there are seven clans, um, and then I also think there are a lot of petty dwarves, like like minor clans that don't have any claim to any one of the like nobility or or whatever. Um, we'll get into that, but uh, maybe they were the original founders. And then their descendants, they thought, like, well, they will also be great craftsmen. And they discovered that the descendants weren't always great craftsmen. Um, and you can have, like, an interesting thing happen where the next sort of founder or master that's born is not of the sort of royal or, or like, noble line, right? It's like if, to use Game of Thrones, right? Like, if 
Bran the Builder, right? It's like an early Stark, and he's like found the Starks, and it's like a big deal. Oh man, and he's the best. And then the Starks kind of fall out from there, thinking like someday we'll have another master will be born. And then it's like a Bolton is the next one, right? So it's someone connected to that that clan, but you know they're the actual master. There's something interesting there. I'm not sure how far we want to go, but yeah. Um, I think the dwarven need for well-made systems could require them to have social systems where societal ills are almost unheard of. Poverty would be evidence of your poor management. Oh, that's kind of cool. Oh, that's cool, Brent. I like uh, a parliamentary structure where you could have a monarch and the prime minister, but in the case of the dwarves, it's a monarch and a prime master. That's kind of cool. Let me look at that. Miscellaneous government system. Parliamentary. That's not a, a parliamentary. What the hell? How do I spell anything? Parliamentary. Parliamentary? You guys are watching my Amy air my dirty laundry. Good God. Um, monarch and prime master. That's kind of cool. I like that. Uh, it, it raises the question if it's parliament, right? Do they have a House of Lords kind of a thing? You could have them be, the House of Lords be the best you know, it's like the best stonemason and the best smith and the best whatever, right? That like the nobility are, because it's a meritocracy, right? So they would be the, I don't know if it's voted for or whatever, but whoever the like 10 best artisans are. And maybe the like merchants have weaseled their way into getting a seat on these councils or something like that, right? Um, I think that's kind of cool. Gully dwarves, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about um, the two roles could mirror the two parents everyone has. Yeah, I want to talk about parenting just a little bit. We're going to jump ahead to the gods for a second. Because um, I think that's cool. I think this is an important thing. So there are two gods that I have like in stone, but or that I have good, strong ideas for. Um, we'll talk about the names maybe a different day because I want to talk about language, but there's also some limitations based on these gods. So there are six gods. Uh, Bor, Hem, Mut, Ath, No, and Vis. Um... And each one maps to one of the six ability scores, right? Um, yeah, the parliament could consist of the nobility and the craftspeople. Like, that's cool. That's cool, Vaughn. Here's here's kind of what I had imagined for the parents. Um, so the notion being with these gods, or with the like family structure, the notion being with these gods is that each different race interprets the gods differently, right? So for the halflings, as is alluded to in the instrument, they have elevated mortals into saints. And so each god is actually three different saints and they represent different values that, that pertain to that particular ability score. So um, one of the ones that comes up in the, uh, in the, the instrument is uh, Saint Noel, who's um, an interpretation of the god of wisdom, um, the halfling interpretation of the god of wisdom, and they are the saint of gardening. Um, for the elves, uh, there's uh, No has uh, the god of wisdom, has Norion, who is the god of trees and forests and sort of growing things. So for the dwarves, then, um, I wanted to think of, like, what is their structure, right? As opposed to, uh... oh, yeah, thanks, dude. Uh, thanks for coming. I will talk to you next time, buddy. It was awesome to have you here. Some, some real great ideas. Uh, keep it real, Brent. Thanks for listening and hanging out. Um, so for the dwarves, then, I wanted to base their six gods off of a family, right? That, like, they in their myths talk about the six gods as being all related to each other. Um, and so, again, because they're tied to individual ability scores, I had some rough ideas, and I wanted to go through what they are. So, Bor is the god of strength. Um, Hem is the god of dexterity, or dexterity-related, you know. Like they aren't exactly just the god of strength. Uh, Moot maps to constitution. Oth maps to intelligence. No maps to wisdom. And Vis maps to charisma. So, I had envisioned the strength god being the god of craft and labor and building, right? That it's all about your ability to craft things and to shape them, and it's, it's smithing, right? It's, it's the god of the forge. Essentially, Moradin. Um, you could just call him Boradin or whatever. Um, but they are the patriarch, essentially, of the, of the pantheon. And then they're equal, right, is, the, uh, is No, is the god of wisdom, who I had imagined as the mother, right? So you have, like, the father and the mother, and the god of wisdom, in this case, represents the earth and stone and mining. Um, I mainly want to do this because uh, the idea of her title being the mother of loads is really cool to me. Um, obviously, the mother load. 
but then you have sort of the Forge Father and the Mother of Loads, and those being the two different um, ha halves of the Dwarven sort of family unit, right? The Mother and the Father. Um, so what I think is interesting about that, that if the Mother is where the, like... Oh, yeah, you could switch it. Uh, I just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, the... the either one of them is above... You could that, that like you could make it a, a the but I think the father of loads isn't as cool right because father load is kind of a thing but I like mother load um, but I think they're equal I don't think that there's like one that is more important than the other I think they they serve different roles here's what I mean so if if you think about the way that a dwarf would interact with like a, a gem or a material they wanted to work like they get some iron out of the earth they mine the iron out of the earth the earth creates the iron and then the dwarf forges it right. So the mother, then, is the earth in this analogy. That It, like, creates the metal. It creates the, the ore or the, the raw material. It makes it. it it's, it's this divine gift that comes out from the ground and that you wait for and you search for and you hope that you'll be blessed with. And then it's the crafter's job to make it into a, an object, something you can use. So I think then that in Dwarven society, if we're going to map this, if we say that the earth is the mother that creates the metal, right, that creates the ore, then the father is the one who shapes it. So I think rather than the way that we think about culture where it's the mother's responsibility to both somehow birth the child and like rear the child, that's the other way around. That the mother births the child, but then the mother's labor is essentially done. The mother has made the child, right, and has sort of given birth to them. And then it's the father's job to raise the child. That the father's labor is to teach them everything that they, that they need to know, right? The father shapes them into what they're supposed to be. Not that a mother couldn't do that. Not that you couldn't have, you know, women who, who raise their children in extremely circumstances. But I think the cultural idea is that it's the father's responsibility to raise the children, um, because they are the they represent the forge father, right? And again, that is the cultural notion. I don't think that that is one hundred percent how it happens every single time. Um, hey, Brooke, thanks for coming back from dinner. Uh, happy birthday, by the way. I don't think it's I don't know if it's your birthday yet where you are. Um, here it is still on the it's still the twenty sixth, and your birthday is tomorrow, right? It's Monday on Memorial Day. So uh, happy birthday, happy early birthday. I was planning on tweeting something about it. So I'm sure you'll see it. Um, Oh, that's cool too, right? That there are a lot of female dwarves because they can... Uh, sorry, a lot of female warriors because they can go off and fight. Um, yeah, so I like the notion that the mother is responsible for giving birth to the child. Like, the, the, those nine months are considered, like, this is the terrible pain and the terrible, like, in, like uh, uh, labor I have to go through. But then it's the father's responsibility to shape them. Oh, uh, steak and cake. I want steak and cake. Yeah, exactly, right? That, like, I, I don't know, I just think that's an interesting dichotomy. It matches with the religion that I want to do, so. Um, the father's responsibility to raise. To raise the child. And again, you can subvert that, you know. I don't think that that's a hard and fast rule for anybody, but culturally, that's, like, what is expected of them. Um, mother's responsibility to birth the child. So, let's talk about marriage for a sec. One thing that Mordenkainen's talks about for dwarves is they talk about the idea that marriage is less, is almost never about love. And that, like, romantic love, I think, is a concept that is foreign to dwarves. Um, in the way that it's, like, so important for elves, I think it's, it's, they just don't, they don't, not that it can't happen, but they don't, their minds don't work that way. A marriage is a partnership. It's like a collaboration, right? They view their partner as someone that they can work with. And I feel like in the courting process involves the dwarves, like the the intended, like the betrothed or whatever. The betrothed? Ooh, nope. Collaborating on a project. Right, they have to make a statue or they have to build a bridge or they have to do whatever, right? Dwarves are seahorses confirmed. Yeah, uh-huh, exactly. Um, no sort of steak, but that's for me. Oh my gosh. Brooke, don't talk to me about that. That sounds so good. Um, but I don't think that they have, I think that they are, ooh, arranged marriages. I think that they don't fall in love. I think that that's like, 
they might have lust or something like that, but I, I don't think that they fall in love in the same way. I think that their marriages are determined by um, um, who would work best together, right? Like what pairing of two people would be the best collaborators on what, you know, like a smith, like an armor smith and a blacksmith or something like that, right, could team up. Or you have two stone carvers, someone who's really good at shaping bronze might work, might marry a stone carver, and then they make these like, beautiful sort of bronze enameled uh, statues, right? Like, I think it's all about what the partnership can do. And it, yes, you're exactly right, Rayo. I think that matchmakers are a big thing in Dwarven society. I think there's someone who looks at who is eligible and whose you know, spouse died last year and who's looking for a new partner and then like syncs them up in the way that will benefit the clan the best. Um, a sacred role in Dwarven society. And it's all about just the mosaicing the clan together in the way that will make it the strongest, right? They're not about um, the engagement jewelry. Yeah, the one only accepts if it's the most delicate. Yeah, right? That like, uh, that's a big part of it. I think you make something for them, right? That the bride gift is really uh, uh, a big part of, or the bride or the girl, whatever, however you want to do it, right? Like it's a huge part of showing that you are worth raising. If you're able to put in the care and, and attention to make this piece, then you are ready to raise a child. Yeah, that's great. Nice work, Jose. Um, yeah, their marriage is a project, right? And so I don't think that there is this notion of like that you love your partner. I think that, that like, I don't know how they feel about sex. I guess that's another good question we should talk about, right? Um, yeah, matchmaker. You're exactly right. That's what I was thinking. I instantly went to Fiddler. I don't know how they feel about sex. Um, because I like the idea of a dwarf who works on another project with another dwarf. That's considered like less, uh, uh, that's considered infidelity. Whereas I don't know how they feel about their physicality, right? Like they don't feel very physical. They don't feel very sexual to me, but I also don't want to like, I mean, that's such a huge part of like politics and interrelations and stuff like that. The idea of saying like, there's no sex in Dwarven society or very little sex in Dwarven society feels weird. So I'm not sure, what do you guys think about sex and dwarves and where that comes from? Yeah, marriages would also take that into account too. With it. So politics is a big part of it too, right? It might be about clans. So like if it's, you know, uh, uh, I think even in the way that you would think of, oh, that's fascinating. How do they feel about same sex relationships? Right, because if it's all about rearing children, hmm. Because I was gonna say the, the the reason I got there was that I could see two clans, right? That like matchmakers could also like, you could work inside the clan for sure, but you could it could also be about like we're trying to ally with the Stonebreaker clan, and so the matchmaker looks at who's eligible in there, and it's almost more important what their trades are, their skills are, than even like what their genders are, right? That like it's more important to sync those things up. Hammer the gold on the anvil. Hammer and anvil is like totally a, like a body dwarven uh, song, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, the long live race, the ceremony would take years. That's cool. Yeah, the courting is really important, I think. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Adam. Dwarves spring out of the ground, fully grown with beards, right? Yeah, I don't know about about gender. I feel like they're rigid, you know? I think the dwarves don't really like... Have a, I think that's an elven thing. I think the elves are very fluid about that. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I want to delve too deep into this, but I feel like, and again, culturally, right? That doesn't mean that they don't exist, but I feel like culturally that's not a thing to dwarves. Um, the, Vaughn makes an interesting point who says the dwarves have distinct biological sexes. I kind of feel like they do, but... I hear what you're saying. Maybe the role you play makes you into the mother or the father. It's like, oh, there's lots of fish that are like that, right? They, they, they can, like, change genders depending on, like, the the rest of the community, right? But I think I think that's a good point, buddy, that, like... But I feel like it's all about the 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 birth, right? I don't know. This is this is a very interesting discussion. I don't know how deep we should get into it. But I, I think... I don't think the idea... Because I, I think it's a lot bound up in, like, what they think about sex, that like child rearing and sex are different things to me, right? That like, and marriage and sex are different things. So I could see it being a thing where dwarves would be a, like, if you're married to someone, is it infidelity to have sex with someone else in dwarven society? Like in human society, probably. Um, 
Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying, right? Jose's on it. At least that's just where I'm at right now. Because then I think it, then same sex doesn't matter then at that point. Like I think that marriages are. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about Mass Effect or Dragon Age. Hmm. I, I, I like the idea of including it. I like the idea of them having like a non-traditional approach to it, right? That I think that they, I don't want it to become like a, well, because there aren't traditionally this in dwarven culture that there shouldn't be. But I feel like dwarves are rigid and I think that they are not flexible in terms of their societal structure. And I think they are also all about children and they're all about like advancing that. So you could have it be like a magical thing where dwarves can change uh, gender submitting on their roles, right? Yeah, I think, I think Adam's getting close. Oh, no, pitch your idea, Reho, please. I want to hear everyone's ideas. That's totally fine. I don't care. Right, right now, you know, we're 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 just talking. There's definitely a way to make anything work. So don't hold anything back if you have an idea. I think Adam's pretty close. Marriages are from making more of the race, but you can sleep with whomever you want as long as you make more. So I think that there are, like, I think it's like m like making gifts and like crafting is considered the more important thing. That like if you were to make a gift for someone, you know, and there may be like complicated dwarven rules about like what rubies mean and what emeralds mean, and if you, if you it's discovered that like cause I could see like dwarves making gifts for each other as like f gifts of friendship or whatever, but I could see there being certain kinds of jewelry maybe or certain kinds of items that it's not appropriate to make or make with someone else, right? And that's considered uh, sort of crossing a border, but the dwarves don't really care sexually about it. I think you could then get into these interesting levels of like they're not supposed to care, right? But they could, right? That like emotions could get tied up in it. Culturally, societally, it doesn't really matter, right? But that doesn't mean that the dwarves don't have emotions, right? My child is provided by a god. So you're saying like, it, then gender doesn't matter, right? That like the gods just provide them with a... Yeah, okay, so you could do that. I mean, it's, it's, it is god, pretty god related, but there's maybe a way that like, this is getting out there. Are dwarves like are they are they do you give birth to dwarves? Are dwarves made? Right? Like like made? Do they craft it together? Jack says, what if there is an uneven ratio of male to female? Maybe the don't view polygamy as a then maybe don't view polygamy as a bad thing and enforce it to sustain their species. Polygamy. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Polygamy is interesting. I think it's. I think it could get icky, but I feel like, depending on how you balance it, right. I don't know. I think. I think, to me, the mother of loads thing that like the the earth being the womb is really important and uh, cool for dwarves. And I think the father being the ones who build build them is cool. Yeah. The dwarves are literally made out of stone. Yeah, it's cool. It, it, it to me, it takes away some of the humanness of like. I don't know. Maybe that's right. Because then they, then they'd be like sexless, right? Like, why have genders then? At all? Then all dwarves are just gender ungendered. I mean, I think it's cool. I'm trying to like wrap my brain around it. So like, they're not, they're not people. Like, would they become? Con they're not constructs then. But the notion of like there being a stage of dwarven, like the life cycle of a dwarf, where you are a construct, or you're like a statue, or you're like a. a... All dwarves are based on what rock they're made out of. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like it's a huge step away, but I, I can get there maybe. I, I I worry it makes them really inhuman and like hard to identify with that like, I think it's cool. Okay, the reason I think it's cool. I think it's cool that then you can have same sex groups, groupings, right? Then you could have two male dwarves or two female dwarves or whatever you want to do. 
you're ungendered until you create a child. But I feel like that's not, I think that's really late in your life. And I feel like you would end up with a lot of ungendered dwarves for a long time. And I don't know how I feel about that. Like, you know, if you're 100 years old and you're ungendered, like, not that you can't do that, but it just feels like you could make like a third gender and say it's like unspecified. But this is getting very far away from, I think the idea of them making them is cool. Because I think it lets you have the same sex groupings, right? But if that exists, then like, then would you, when making the child, would you make a daughter? Would you make a son? Like, how do you... Because I'm worried that if, if we say they're ungendered for 100 years or whatever, because I imagine it takes a long time. Yeah, 404. No, gender not found. Um, if we say it takes too long, right, or it takes that long, then I'm worried that you... That's, like, an important defining characteristic. You know, if someone wants to play a dwarf who is younger than that, then, like... Does that force them into playing a non-binary dwarf, right? Or an ungendered dwarf? Hmm. Gender's up to the gods. Yeah, I, I could see it being random, right? I could just see it being like you make the child and then it it is one of the two. And like no one knows how or what, what makes that determination, just like, you know, with humans. I think that's I think it's right that they're that it's randomized and no one is clear, you know, on how to do it. And you there's no way to know and it just happens. I mean, I don't mind it, like, not being a thing that is determined until a certain age, but I feel like marriage is too long, you know? Um, so, okay, <laughs> this is crazy. So they're made out of stone, um, and they and they do it together. You kind of still lose the mother of loads thing, then, I f I'm worried about, because then the notion of the mother as being the womb... A gender is a thing, and I'm not trying to say that it's not. I'm not trust trying to say that, like, those dwarves couldn't exist, but I feel like... Or those people, certainly those people exist. Um, I just don't know. I just, I think saying dwarves are a non-binary race, I don't like the idea of like attaching something like that to a a, a player race, especially because I, I'm hoping to have most of the players be dwarves in the campaign. I'm going to try to get my main three in both parties to be uh, dwarves. So I have six dwarven players and like some guests that come in. And I don't feel comfortable saying that like, this race that is going to dominate the game, like, doesn't, is, is by definition non-binary, you know? I think the notion of it is cool, but I don't know if it's quite right for the setting. Because I'm trying to wrap my mind around, like, so now it means you lose the idea of childbirth as, a, as, a, as an institution. You lose the idea of, like, childbirth and sex as like motivators for characters on some level right you think about again but i'm using game of thrones as one of the two touchstones that it's like hobbit setting was sort of game of thrones politics imagine taking game of thrones and losing sex not just as like boobies but losing sex as a motivator or losing sex as a, a force in society what happens to that society and like the notion of po political intrigue without sort of personal intrigue i think removing sex and not that we remove it entirely, but now it's it's like role is very nebulous. So how do you keep those things while keeping? Because I think building the dwarves is cool, but but how do you keep those things without losing? You know how do you, how do you keep the like the the gendered and sexual politics in there? Because I think that's important for sort of scheming and backstabbing. If you lose the act of sex and use the act of sort of like childbirth in the traditional sense, right? If it becomes like a project that they work on together, we made a child. Um, I don't know. They don't talk about it. Is that a thing with Klingons? Yeah, okay. Reho's pretty close. Gender dwarves can exist, but perhaps the women are tasked with finding the elements to be made with the creation of a child. The men have to craft it. That's close. I think that's pretty good. Talking about the older the family, the stronger the dwarves you can make. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I'm not sure. I think this is interesting. I think we lose... The, I think... The, yeah. Because the womb, though... I'm so attached to this idea of the mother of loads, right? The Klingon scape is about how the makeup of... Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I think there's something interesting about it being private, that, like, how much do you know? And if, the, if there weren't so many dwarven PCs, then I don't think it would matter. I think we could kind of, like... The dwarves are secretive about these things. Um, but I, if we're going to have dwarven PCs, right? 
Okay, I think I think here's where, here's where I'm at right now. Yeah, you did that that could that could totally be possible. Here's where I'm at right now. I think that the the, the, the one I'm the closest to is that the mother character, whether it's male or female, but generally, you know, the, the assumption, uh, uh, but I, there shouldn't be an assumption. The mother provides the, the ore, like it's their job to find it, right, and bring it back. And then it's the, the like, father's job to sculpt it and shape it. I think that's the closest. I, I just, I don't know. I miss the notion of, of the mother in the womb and the childbirth and stuff. Because I think that's important for the religious thing. But this seems to be... I, I like that it allows the same-sex couplings, right? And theoretically non-gendered or non-binary dwarves, like non-agendered dwarves. Okay, I think this is all good. I think we're going to set it aside for now. Yeah, that's a big thing. I want maximum player options, that's true. But I, So I think we're going to set it aside for now. I, I'm close to a decision, I think, but I, I want to sleep on it. I want to figure it out. Um, so we're going to move on. Yeah, you're right. Marriage isn't about sex, and the sex politics won't matter as much anymore. And, like, that's okay. We can figure out new politics. It can be all about trade. I think it's mostly about trade. But a lot of the, like, the interpersonal drama comes from the sex, right? So I don't want to discard it because I think there's some really fascinating ideas there. And I think there's probably a middle road to be taken. But I say we come back to it. But that's all family stuff. Like, the children is really important. And whether or not they're crafted or born, you know, it's all about raising them and making them into the into, right, into good people, into, you know, worthy descendants and so on and so forth. Um, so memory is the last one I wanted to talk about. We talked about this with drinking and booze. That, like, dwarves who drink um, remember rather than forget... Cool, yeah, I appreciate that, Adam, if you have an idea. Um, yeah, please, There's uh, Discord is also available. It's not very popular, not very trafficked, but we have a public and a, pri a, public and a patron Discord, so if you want to go check those out, you can definitely leave some thoughts there. Uh, shrooms. Um, drinking and booze, dwarves who drink, remember rather than forget. Um, ale is therefore very important in Dwarven society. One of their... One of their chief pastimes. But I think, like, history and, like, memory and, like, great deeds of the past are super important to them, are vital to Dwarven society. I think it's all about, like, how they... I think the reason, like, I think they raise great statues, statues commemorating commemorating kings and monarch kings and queens and masters and heroes right i think that like the coom is like littered with shrines and like i'm and i'm imagining like argonoth style like huge like uh mountain sized monuments right that like look out over the landscape and all kinds of like i think it's a lot of its function, a lot of its engineering, right? Like aqueducts and, and dams and dikes and things like that. But I think a lot of it, too, is just like grandiose Valley of the Kings style. Like, look at this person and they're etched in stone. And the best way to remember someone is to etch them in stone, right? So it's all carvings and bas relief. How much role does writing play in memory? Is the crafted item more important than the instructions to make it? The written word also allows for information to be used by other dwarves. That's interesting. We haven't really talked about language. Um, I mean, runes are sort of traditional. I kind of like the idea of dwarven language being less about, um, like, you could have them be like, like, runes are there, but the way that runes worked, like, in Old Norse, like, Norse runes, they were less, they were sometimes used for writing, but it, it was more about naming, and it was less about, like, it wasn't clear that, like, what you would write and what you would speak, like, those are different things. You know what I mean? They, they were decoupled entirely. You wouldn't think of like, oh, this is that rune, and like the, the, the runic alphabet really had anything to do with the Old Norse language. They were, they were, they were kind of separate languages, um, as far as my understanding goes. So there's something kind of cool about that, about like, oh, like engineering. Because my instinct is to say that like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I had two instincts. So I had hieroglyphs and like pictographs. Like they're all about... Uh, pictographs, right? That like artistry is important in how you how you show uh, history. So it'd be very uh, rare for them to write anything down about history. 
But the notion of a secret, the notion of like a mathematical language, a language about engineering, I think is really cool. And that, that could be sort of runic and you can get that sort of rune vibe, but it's used specifically for writing down like, or carving uh, equations and instructions on how to build things. I like the notion of, of an oral tradition too, of maybe like uh, engineering stuff and, and um, uh, math and like the sciences, you know, that like what they would learn about architecture and what they would learn about engineering that would need to be passed down. In a previous campaign setting I ran, the dwarves were all about writing. And they were like one of, they were sort of the big, they had invented all the alphabets in most of the languages in the world, right? So like there's something kind of cool about that. But I, I, I think, I like the notion of them using hieroglyphs and pictographs uh, language slash written word. I think with language, real quick, a dwarven is hard to pronounce and I think it's inexpressive. Right? I don't think Dwarven is a good language for anyone to write poetry in. You know, I think it's flint. I think it's got kind of a romance language vibe. But not that romance languages are inexpressive, but like there's a, it's small vocabularies, right? And it's it's hard to say. Well, sure, sure. Uh, Vaughn has is looking ahead and saw plagiarism as advice. I think plagiarism could apply to other works too, right? Like if you make a statue that's very similar to someone else's statue, um, which plagiarism is fascinating to me and I want to talk about. Um, but I think, I mean, I think they definitely have scripts. I like the idea of two languages. I like the idea of, of runes slash dwarven writing is very different from spoken dwarven. It could be a generational thing. It could be that like at certain times they had, uh, uh, like they, the early dwar old dwarven is all pictographs. And then they've developed runes since then because, like, they would obviously have to communicate with humans, right? Mm, yeah, anyone can write history, anyone can write engineering, but only the highest of them can recite architectural evolution, like arch architectural history, engineering history. They would have to have some kind of script that they could communicate with humans, but I guess they could just write in common. Um, but I feel like it's it's secondary to them. Like, I like it having a mathematical component, a written dwarven is runic, but largely mathematical used for engineering. Engineering and architecture. I do think they have, as much as I've said that their language is inexpressive, I do think that they have uh, an oral or a poetic tradition as well. Poetry. Because I liked the notion of, um, again, pulling from The Hobbit, two of my favorite bits of sort of dwarven lore that you get. You get the um, the dwarven song of old wealth, right? That the hobbits, uh, the dwarves sing in the hobbits uh, in Bilbo's in Bag End, right? Which gives you kind of this like beautiful textured history of their sort of fall out of Erebor. And then there's one about Durin that uh, Gimli recites in Moria that is similarly like this this rich ballad about the dwarves and their, their great works. So I, I like the idea of having a similar thing. And there's there's a reference to like a dirge, I think, in Mordenkainen's. So I think there is such a thing as dwarven poetry, but I feel like it, it serves a weird purpose. You know, I don't think it's... Like, it, it, I think Elvin makes dwarven sound ridiculous as, as a language, right? Um, I always like the idea that dwarves have some kind of innate stone shaping skills, meaning that stone can be literally molded so they can make structures that other races cannot. I mean, I think, I don't know if they have like literal stone shaping abilities, but I think that they have access to those kinds of spells. They, they probably invented the spell stone shape. But I also think they just have like an eye and an ability to create things. Like with, with I think a dwarf can pick up, like almost like a master assassin can kill anybody with any like tool or like a simple object. I think that like a, like a dwarf, the most common dwarf can pick up a, a simple tool and can use it and utilize it in a way that no one else could possibly do, right? Like, I think that's a big part of it is that it's, they just see things differently and they see, like, they look at the block of marble and they see the statue inside it. It's a statue that no one else has the skill to, to create and know where to, to put the weight and how it can be structured and, and still have this graceful beauty, right? 
What if runic dwarven came from accounting and trade? So it's the low language for trade and communicating with others. The creation language is sacred and se sacred and secret. Yeah, I like that. Dwarven poetry would be based on the sounds of a forge. Oh, that's kind of cool. That it's like like hard and like repetitive and like yeah, that's cool. The dwarven poetry has this like boom. It's like meant to be recited at the forge. Yep, that's great. Okay, two things though. Um, language, script, used for accounting, accounting and trade considered low um i'm trying to think of like like the door to moria right has language i guess i think that's technically an elvish um in, in moria but like what kinds of carvings are you seeing like i like the idea that dwarves carve in almost entirely in like pictographs and and bas relief that they don't put words on things you know that words are are insufficient to describe like great deeds or or people that like words are rarely carved on anything pictographs are more elegant and they take more time to make right i think they sign their creations i don't think they do sign their creations because i think that you can look at i think ideally you could look at their creation and see that it's made by this person that like any dwarf, like a human might not be able to, but a dwarf could look at a hammer and look at the way that the steel is shaped and the glimmers on it and the very intricate carvings, right? And they would, they would know without having like putting a label on its tawdry. It's too much. It's too obvious, right? That like a human might need a label, but a dwarf doesn't. A dwarf can look at a hammer and say, "I know exactly who made this." You can tell. Maybe they have like maker's marks or something like that. That's kind of cool, but like I don't think it's words, you know. Um, maker's marks. So that kind of gets us into, oh, I want to do, um, meant to be recited at the forge. Like it's written at the forge. Right, that it ha has a consistent hammering beat. And so when it's like recited in the hall, everyone's banging their tankards, right? That it has this meter, this very particular meter. Yeah, that's so good, Jose. Nice work, buddy. Cool. Um, so let's talk about vices. So I have four here, and there could definitely be more. Um, dwarves are totally rappers. Yeah. I mean, that's. I don't know if you guys know anything about Icelandic poetry, but Icelandic poetry is really fascinating. It's different than dwarven poetry, I think, in this case. But it, Icelandic poetry was cool because they could, like... Um, they could stop and start like it, it wasn't about telling a story because everyone knew the story it was about how you told it and like the words you used in the kennings so they would do things like let's say you're telling the story of thor fishing right where he like goes fishing for jormungand or the world serpent and like pulls it up that like one skald one norse poet would tell could tell it one one way and could emphasize like could stop at any time and add in as many verses and kennings as they wanted to describe how strong Thor is and his muscles and all this stuff. And the same person could tell the, could tell the same story, the same or a different scholar could tell the same story and emphasize how fierce the serpent was, right? And go over and over and over in that and, and focus on that element of it. And they could tell either like a horror story essentially or a sort of heroic narrative. But it's the same story. It's the same, and everyone knows what happens in it. So there's something kind of cool about that, that they're all about history, that everyone, they're, they're not telling you stories you've never heard. It's not original compositions. Yeah, that's important. Not original compositions, but recollections of history. They're just telling what happened. They, the notion of fiction to a dwarf is odd. Fiction is weird for dwarves. It's like lying. It's like lying. I don't know, actually, the Kalevala. You should tell me about it, buddy. I'm not, I know it's, it's, Finnish, right? Finnish epic poetry? Okay, so let's talk about vices. Uh, I think the biggest and most important one is greed, right? You, you, can't, you can't get anything more dwarven than greed. I think greed is the thing that you're not, is like the, the prime vice, what you're supposed to avoid, but what every dwarf uh, uh, plays into. Mordenkainen talks about a dwarven god called, I think, Abathor, Abathor, who is sort of the dwarven god of greed. And he's almost the Loki-esque sort of trickster figure. And we have an opening in the Pantheon for the Dex-based god, but I don't know that that really fits. Um, yeah, dude, I'd love to see it, Jose. That's cool. Um, but I think greed is the struggle of individual dwarves to spend their money. Like, that sounds really simple, but I think that, like, wealth 
is meant to be spent, right? It's like a big important dwarven idea. And so hoarding wealth is considered a, like a grave, I don't know if it's a sin, but it's considered like a dangerous practice. I don't know if I want to go quite so far as like the Hobbit movie did and talk about like the dragon sickness, but there's something about that I think is really interesting that like the gold ill, that like something about to hoard more, yeah. Did I spell it right? Yeah. That like it, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's almost treated like addiction maybe. That's kind of interesting. Like how much money do they have and they're not spending any and they're being miserly, right? Like gold hoarding is treated like and addiction that like it's it's necessary you need the money or like wealth i guess it's necessary to build right you, you're supposed to spend it on works to build and improve your clan your clan but it's alluring it's seductive And it always smells like more. Yeah, right. That like I think I think it's a lot about that about hoarding it. Um, and so that plays into defense, and it plays into security, and it plays into like will someone steal? And this we'll talk about suspicion in a little bit. But the notion of greed that like you like it would be considered like a scandal to discover. Like embezzlement is one thing. I guess embezzlement is probably really bad actually. Embezzlement is a big crime. The clan. Embezzlement is a big crime, or is a big scandal, an important crime. Um, I like the idea of like dwarven kings like being discovered to have squirreled away money, right? That like, think of like greed and financial crime as sort of being the sort of sex scandals of our current politics. That like, it's this thing that like everyone kind of wants to hear about because it, it implies this like weakness, this salaciousness that like dwarves must collect the wealth because it is supposed to help them do these things. But I don't know, it's tough. Like because the way we think about money and the way that like dwarves have traditionally been characterized as being sort of like, especially if you look at Tolkien, there's a lot of problematic depictions of dwarves as being basically sort of like the medievalist view on Jews. Right, so I'd be worried about getting too deep into this, but greed is like such an important part of being of what a dwarf is and the, the accumulation of wealth. It's like I, I like the addiction angle because I, I think it makes it feel like you can look at someone and say, "Oh, that's interesting." Only if kept for personal use, if if like spent on the clan or works, it's often pardoned or overlooked. Yeah, that's cool. But I like the notion of it's treated like an addiction that like, once you start doing it, they can't stop, they can't stop. And it's a common problem among dwarves. And I could even see it like that it, it isn't about the gold so much as it is about like possession, right? That like once they are like standing on the income stream or, or whatever, right? That like taking in this thing and being the only one who can have it and not letting anyone, not sharing, not letting anyone else get involved or, or, or take a piece of it, right? Like it's about selfishness and, and desire. I think that's, that's really big. Uh, so one thing I wanted to talk about before was um, – uh, Vaughn brought up this idea of like dwarves not abandoning their creations. And I think that's I think that's probably true. But I liked the notion, and I want to explore this idea of like, do the dwarves, if they get something, right? Like if, if let's say they make something, they make a hammer, I keep using this hammer example, they make a war hammer and it's great and they like it and then they sort of add it to their heap of war hammers. They, they put it on the wall and then they have this new idea, right? They want to make an ax. So now they go and they spend months crafting it and designing it and they make several prototypes and they find, okay, this is the good axe. This is the axe that I wanted to make. What do they think about their hammer now? Do they care about their hammer anymore? Is their hammer still worth, have, still have the same value that it did or are they more interested in this axe or the sword or the shield or whatever it is they're gonna make next? If, what happens when someone wants to use the hammer? What happens if someone steals the hammer or breaks the hammer? 
Like, I like the idea of dwarves making things and heaping them up and saying, look at all the things I made, but not really knowing what to do with them, right? That, like, you don't necessarily make things... Uh, the, the, I can see them falling down this trap of, like, making something that has no purpose or making something that's, like, a vanity project. Right? I wanted to make it because I wanted to make it. And then not sharing it or not allowing other people to use it. That, like, that they have this sense of possession over something, this childlike, it's mine and you can't have it. This covetous... Covetive, Covetousness? Covetousness. Which I think is really important. So that's my question. Like, what, how, how does a dwarf view their works after they've finished them and they're not using them anymore? Like, can, is, is it for other people to use? Are they very open-handed about that? That doesn't feel very dwarven to me. It feels like they would hoard them and keep them to themselves. And like, that's part of the sin, right? It's like, that the dwarven ideal is to share, is to use it to better the clan, but almost no dwarf can fully commit themselves to that. Um... Do they share their creations? Creations. I made it. It's mine. Mm, yeah, the object's not as important. Eh, it depends. I could see that. I mean, the thing is, it depends on what it is, right? But I like the, the idea of, like, the secret recipe being very valuable. Dwarves are suspicious of all others, including other dwarves. All others, including other dwarves. So I think that this is interesting. Because I, I feel like a lot of these ones are all tied into each other. Yeah, awesome. See you later, Vaughn. Thanks for hanging. Thanks for all your ideas, buddy. I think it's, uh, it's in a really good place. I think that dwarves are... Suspicious as a as a conceit that like suspicion and greed and defense right are all kind of tied up together. That the dwarves are concerned about defense because they believe that everyone is out to get them. Everyone is out to get them to steal their wealth, to vandalize their creations. They view anyone outside like they claim to be suspicious of anyone outside the clan I think they're like, I think they're they're openly suspicious of anyone outside the clan openly suspicious of anyone outside the clan but inwardly suspicious of everyone everyone including and especially members of their own clan I think that's an important distinction that like suspicion, outside suspicion, is a good thing. Is a good thing. Like the dwarves, it's a, culturally it's important that you are skeptical and suspicious of your neighbors. That there is not a lot of trust between dwarven communities, right? Like uh, that they have sensible alliances and trading relationships or whatever, but like there's always the sense that they're going to swindle you or they're trying to learn your secrets or whatever. Um, inside suspicion, or inward suspicion, suspicion inside the clan is a bad thing. But you're supposed to trust your clan. But I don't think anyone does. I think the conceit with the dwarves is that they have an almost solipsistic view that, like, they are, if, like, if you boil it down, the only thing that a dwarf really cares about at the end of the day is them and their own work. Not in that they couldn't care about someone else. But they are suspicious that that person has ill intent for them. Suspicion steeps all of dwarven culture, I think. They don't necessarily want it to, and they wouldn't necessarily admit that, but I think that's like a deep and profound vice that the dwarves struggle with. I think the one exception is a parent to a child. I think that the only person that a dwarf does not suspect or is not suspicious of is their own offspring. They can view them in a positive and sort of like unconditional light positively and unconditionally. Cool, that's good. Uh, Vaughn's not here, alas, but we're gonna talk plagiarism. So the idea of plagiarism being a dwarven vice is that if they're all about originality, or they're all about creativity, the notion of someone either passing their work off as someone else's or taking credit for someone else's work or creating something that is too similar, right? Yes, exactly, an extreme offense. 
Um, and I think similarly in here, greed. We should go back for just a second because we're gonna. This is gonna touch in jealousy. I think is a big deal. Dwarves covet what they do not have. Have including prestige and glory. Oop. So I think that like this is one of those weird ones where a dwarf can be inspired by jealousy. Like that can be a good thing. I think jealousy, and I actually kind of think this sometimes too. I think jealousy is deceitful because it can sometimes inspire you to be better. If you see someone who's successful or having some has something that you want or has achieved something that you want, you can, right, you can look at it. Oh, racial FOMO. Yeah, for sure. I think that's great, right? They, they see it and they think, that could have been me. Like, I could have those accolades. I could have made that and I didn't make it. That's such a, as an artist, that's like such a thing. When you like, you read a book you really like or you see um, a movie that you really, uh, or like a performance you really admire or whatever. Like, it's very easy to look at that and say, God, why didn't I think of that? Why, why, why am I not that good? This person has made something that I could never make and I don't even have the brain power to begin to think of something that they, that, that is anywhere near as good as this. That's such a thing with being an artist. So I think that has to be reflected here. And I think that it is sometimes seen as being a good thing. That uh, looking at someone else's work and using that as a motivator to work on your own thing can be positive. But of course, it can also, and almost inevitably leads towards that slide of viewing other people's success and other people's you know, uh, achievements as undeserved that they, you know, that I should be the one who got the glory rather than them. So I think jealousy and plagiarism and greed and suspicion are all tangled up together. But it's an ex plagiarism is an extreme offense um, because, as, as uh, Jose puts it, it undervalues the work done and often elevates undeserving work. Um, it's all about... And it takes, but I also think it's like something that dwarves like can't help but do sometimes, right? That like, because I think a lot of the, the like any, but any work they are inspired to create is an uphill battle to avoid uh, plagiarism. That like a dwarf will see someone carve an incredible statue and think, I could have carved that. And it will try to carve their own version of the statue, but it's impossible for them to extricate their jealousy from their creativity. And they end up creating a pale imitation that maybe will go unnoticed depending on who they are, but could cause a scandal. All the greatest dwarven scandals are about plagiarism. <laughs> Pay a fee to copy it, right? Laws against it, a weird bureaucracy, bureaucracy, I don't know how to spell that word, weird um, bureaucracy, boy. No, got it. Nope. <laughs> I thought I did. Oh, uh, who cares? Um, laws against it, as nasty as slander. I don't know how often it comes up, but I think I, I think it, it feeds suspicion. Dwarves are always looking at other people's work. Oh, dude, yeah, spelling a lie like well, people watch You're trying to spell ridiculous, impossible. Looking at other people's work and attempting to assess whether someone ripped them off. Ripped them. Off. I did it again. Asses. One S. Assess. Nope. Two S's. That's weird that that's, it's, it's just asses with an extra S. Silly. Gee, thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Do we think there are any other big dwarven vices or virtues that I have missed here? We have creation, defense, longevity, family, memory. Uh, greed. A supreme patent, that's funny. Suspicion, well, we can talk about justice. I think that's more into the uh, societal stuff, but suspicion, plagiarism, trade. Okay. 
So the, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about the gods. Maybe we'll go for another 10, 15 minutes. Um, we'll see, we'll see how we feel. So we have six gods here. Um, and we talked about the god of crafting and we talked about the god of the earth. Um, I still think regardless of where we land with the child rearing and stuff that I still want the father and the mother here. I think the mother of loads is just such a cool phrase. And such a cool idea that I don't want to lose it, and it's making me worried about where we're going to land with that. But let's go through these. So, so we have the God of Strength, um, and the way these names work, which we won't really go into, but just so you guys know, that uh, each one of the gods, the like uh, different um, interpretations of them, incorporates the god's names. The god, the god's names are all three-letter, very monosyllabic, so Bor, Hem, Mut, Oth, No, and Vis. Um, so, for example, the Elven God of Strength. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Rejo. I really like it, too. I thought it was cool. Um, the elven god of strength is Iboriel. Um, so it's like Iboriel, right? So it has boar in it. Um, right. Oh, missed it. Tuffed it. There you go. Iboriel. So ideally, when we do the names, it'll have those in there. I think we're going to bypass the names for now because I'd like to talk about language before we really do that. But let's just see if we can just brainstorm some ideas and some imagery stuff. And, like, you know, they have symbols. The gods have, like, abstract symbols. But, again, the dwarves can interpret these in different ways. So, you know, they're all, I think they're all one family. And so I have some basic stuff here. We have Bor, or Strength, right, the, the god of crafting, Boradin, essentially, um, is the father. And then we have dexterity hem who i'd imagine being the uncle sort of the father's brother but i don't know anything about this god yet and we should talk about that we have moot um make the uncle off the trading coin would not be an ideal of a good raised son so that's yeah that's what i was thinking about was the notion of like so so you have some gods that are positive and some gods that are sort of negative in connotation and i feel like the dexterity god is kind of negative but i don't know exactly how to uh iterate on that but I liked the notion of sort of the disappointing, disappointing son. Um, it could definitely be the brother too, um, but I feel like at least two of them are in that category. So the notion that like that's one of the great stories in the dwarven sort of mythology is that, uh, oh no, I mean, I think either one is totally val valid, Jose, and we may move them, but the notion of uh, uh, that, that Bor or Boradin didn't properly raise the sun and this is why they sort of turned out that way right that like this is it's like a a fable or a, a moral ill like be careful because even the gods if they're not careful enough will sometimes like raise a low child so like off is seen as being a uh a sort of necessary evil you know what i'm saying the immature son the childish one could be yeah that's possible. So let's talk about, about the, just bust through the rest of them real quick. So to me, the uh, god of war is the constitution one. The constitution is the god of war because it's about how much you can take, less about how much damage you can deal. So it's all about shields and armor and, and strongholds and stuff, the, which I imagine being Boar's sister, or potentially the, the mother's sister, the aunt character. Um, and a bunch of different names, essentially. St stone Maiden, Shield Maiden, Stone Sister, Shield Sister, whatever you want to do. The God of uh, Intelligence, is, I had connected to wealth and coins and trade and that kind of thing, which makes sense to me. And is currently the son, but could be the brother as well. And we talked about Wisdom, um, the God of the Earth and Stone and Mining and Precious Gems. And they would view the Earth as their mother, the place they came from, the womb. Um, the mother and the, the mother of loads. And then... Uh, yeah, bears the pain of birth. Yeah, sure, the aunt bears the pain of battle. I think that's cool. And then the daughter is the god of drinking and feasting and merrymaking, which is charisma. Because I think that's such an important part of dwarves is the carousing and all that stuff. We talked about it a little bit, but I like the idea of it being tied to a particular god. And I like the idea of rather than sort of the lusty male Dionysian Lothario, of it being a female character. Because I feel like that's a little bit more interesting. So tie that to the daughter. Um, yeah, so then what we don't have is we don't have the dexterity-based god. And here's the trick, is I can't really think of a, an important dwarven cultural idea that dexterity really encompasses. Um, I've had thoughts for, like, secrecy or, um, you know, the jealousy stuff. I feel like dexterity is, like, a, a polemic or polarized virtue to constitution. Um, so it feels to me like it would be the opposite of that. So it could be, like, the god of treachery or the god of you know stealth or something like that but i feel like that's not a super dwarven concept 
And it's probably iterated better in a different pantheon. I want these gods to be unique. So we need to figure out, like, what is something that's, like, reasonably dexterity-related that uh, could work here? And I, I like the idea that it's it's maybe not necessarily a positive thing, right? To do kind of a Loki, almost a trickster god is sort of what I had been imagining. Like, the pale shadow of, of the father character. Um... The caring daughter that is not yet ready for battle of birth but looks for the comfort of the father is kind of interesting. Yeah. These are some interesting, like, lore stuff you got here, Jose, for the uh, for the deities. So, I don't know. What do we think about the god of dexterity? Like, ideas being... Oh, shit. Nope. Do not open a file. Get out of here. Ideas being things like... Secrets. Um, like, uh, stealth is wrong, but, like... Hidden, almost like a Doomathoin kind of a thing. Uh, suspicion, uh, trickery. The god of like traps, or the god of like engineering. I'm not sure, but it feels like lazy brother would rather sneak about and steal ideas rather than make them. Yeah, that's kind of like Abathor. I think that's kind of interesting. Like the god of of. I mean, plagiarism is weird as a god idea, but yeah, I think that's kind of right. Like the god of of like it's weird to say dexterity is related to sloth, but something about that, right? Someone who would rather like take than make. Um, I mean, we could just say it's the god of thieves, right? That like that if dwarves are all about defense and protection then they would, it would, it would be like a very, uh, uh, I get the undefined god. Thieves uh, it jumps out to me because it's something they would never aspire to be. It's very antithetical to who they are, so it works as kind of an adversarial god, right? That if they are all about protecting their wealth and lock, sealing the doors and keeping people out, that a god of thieves would be like almost a, a satanic is the wrong term, but a very adversarial idea of a god. And you can pose them as as the brother um, who is the exact opposite of the the uh, uh, hardworking god, right? He plays Rise or Steel, but he's also the one that brings the new element. Yeah, that's cool. They, they talk about that a little bit with um, Abathor, the god of greed, that, like, they're the changing god, like, the god that um, um, is the only one that can introduce anything new in the sort of dwarf, rigid dwarven society. The god of innovation is as much about greed and desire as it is about anything else. Um, so let's, yeah, I like it being... I think, I think god of thieves is good. Mobile and easily movable would be lazy to the dwarves. Can't stand someone who doesn't stand still. Yeah, God of Change. I I, I kind of like calling them the God of Thieves, but I think I think they encompass a lot of what you're talking about, right? That like it's about um, mobility and like shiftlessness and um, flexibility. That it's about taking ideas and and. Uh, Plagiarize or steal, but it's not the one that brings the new element. The god of the shifting hands. It's something like that. Like, that, that, that would be something they would ward against, right? That, like, you should bulwark it and, and prevent the thief from getting in. That, like, even the notion of, like, the god of thieves as being, like, a... The, I like the idea of, like, a dwarf who designs a vault, right? Then, like, praise to the god of thieves to, like, show them the weaknesses, right? That, like, it's almost like a test, to see, you know, if 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 someone breaks into it, then it's like, oh, you didn't make the proper uh, uh, oaths to the god of thieves or the proper prayers or whatever. That like, yes, he's a bad guy, but you occasionally have to treat with him because he's the one that like oversees that stuff, right? That like, if you can appease him, then it won't. Uh, yeah, it's almost like a beta tester, right? That like, he's the god of chaos. He's the god of of things going wrong. He's the god of thieves and and of problems and chaos. Something like that, I think, is right. I, I want to think of like the right word for it because I feel like god of chaos is a little bit too general. But I like the notion of it being a god that you rarely pray to, but you do pray to when you need to test something out or sort of want to be challenged, right? 
a difficult god, like a shady god, a god of laziness and like quick fixes and things, all these sort of antithetical dwarven ideas. Okay, yeah. I think that's all pretty good, folks. I, I'm still not sure about the childbirth thing is the only thing I'm still kind of like mulling over because I feel like it's, yeah, we talked about it. There's some interesting notions there. I'm not sure what is the best like blend of all the different ideas i want to i want to keep i want the, the the politics to be as meaty as possible you know he's preyed on the fumes of the forge interesting um i want the politics to be as interesting and diverse as possible and i think you need some human factor in there but i also want to allow for as many player options as vaughn said and i want to allow for sort of non-standard player options. I want there to be a place in the society for people of any gender or no gender, and I want there to be a place for, you know, um, um, same-sex or same-gendered couplings. And, you know, we have to figure out, like, what role sex plays in the society. So that might be a conversation we have at a different time. I'm going to think about it and maybe talk to my fiancé. She's always a good sounding board and see where I'm at with that stuff. But I, I think... A lot of these ideas are not ideas I ever would have had. You know, I would have kind of stuck in this sort of standard uh, uh, fantasy tropes, and I feel like it's really good to discuss them and air them and figure out what's right for the setting. But I think we've done some excellent work here. I'm really excited to delve into some of these ideas. Let's talk about this. What do we want to hit next time? Because I figured we would do at least one more week of this before we'd, we would switch to one of the villains and do some more villain building. Um, we have a lot of different ideas here. Um, other topics include the calendar, language, history, economy, political structure, justice, relations with other races, and the seven different clans. Some of them seem to make sense to fall back on later. Um, I have some geography down here, too, of things that are in the world. I drew, like, a really rough idea of what I think the map looks like. Um, what are the imperfection and unknown minerals in the, in the metal work? I have to look in my books. Yeah, if you got any more ideas, hit me up. You can uh, contact me on Twitter. Uh, you guys mostly know me. I'm at XP Web Series, or you can go to our uh, Discord, uh, which is public. Let me maybe get that link. Um, there's geography stuff we could talk about. I have a bunch of dungeon ideas. I'm just trying to write down every idea I possibly have. I'm leaning towards language for next time because I feel like that will then help us name some stuff. Uh, are there other, or we could we could do a deeper dive on these gods, which I think maybe that's the right thing to do for next time. And try to flesh out their like stories and their histories and stuff. I mean, we could do some right now, but I feel like we're kind of winding down a little bit. So maybe next week, let's let's really double down on gods. I feel like today was like all about culture, which I think is good. It's important to get these things down, but you know, we can spend a little bit more time fleshing out who the character is and like what their what their deal is and how they relate and like practices of their religions and like how big of a presence do they have in the culture? These individual gods and religions. Yeah, I think that that's probably about right. I mean, we'll do that next time. Gods and Society Foundation. Cool. I'm into that. Yeah. A language we can hit on a, on a future one. I just want to like get some of these names down. Okay, great. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I wasn't sure if it was just going to be me talking uh, into a void, but we had a really good chat. We had a lot of different voices thrown around in here. I'm curious to see where all this stuff ends up. Um, if you have any more ideas or any more questions or thoughts, um, yeah, exactly. And then we can go from there into government and society and justice and all that stuff like that. Um, yeah, we'll be back uh, next Sunday. I should be here. I think we're going to have a slightly shorter stream um, next Sunday because we only have about two hours in the space. Um, but that should be plenty to, to get the gods figured out. Uh, thanks so much for uh, coming and chatting, everybody. It was awesome to see everybody back and here and excited. Yeah, it's great. Thanks for everyone's ideas. Um, and we will be back next Sunday around the same time, about 5 o'clock, and we'll talk about Dwarven Gods. Uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Rejo. I'm really happy uh, you showed up. I know you, I always see you on Twitter, buddy, and I I've, uh, I always like it whenever we get a chance to interact, so I'd love to see you next week. Um, yeah, well, you know what, Adam? I love dwarves too, but more importantly, I love you. Oh, uh, let me get you to the Patreon Discord. I think we mo mainly use it for Dungeon Crawl right now, um, but I can make a new server uh, for y'all if you want. Um, it's, yeah, it's mainly the sort of home of the Dungeon Crawl. But let me set up a new one, uh, a new server, and then I will get back to you on that, Adam. I can send it to you on Twitter tonight when I get it figured out. But yeah, great. Oh, that'd be awesome. So we'll be back Sunday at 5. Um, oh no, I've covered my face. Ah. Sunday 5, 5.15, usually by the time I get everything together. Um, but thanks for coming and hanging out. Uh, and once again, as always, happy birthday, Brooke. Thanks, dudes. See you next week.